You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. All right, welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. This month, we are chatting about growing up goth. We are reviewing the new album from New Today. Uh, we have an interview at the end of the show with the guys from the We Have a Technical podcast. And we are also hanging out with Angel from the band Guild de Morn. Of course, we have the new segment, Goth Word of the Month, uh, Sinister Suggestions, and a bunch of other stuff. So as always, I am The Count, and I am here with my stand-in co-host this month, Trey. Hello, Trey. Hello, Count. How's it Thank, going? Uh, pretty good. Thanks for coming back. And as I said, our guest this month is the incredibly talented uh, singer of Guild the Morn, Angel. Thanks for coming on, Angel. Hello. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Angel is the vocalist of Guild the Morn. Uh, helps write some of the music as well, I believe, if I if I get that right. I'll have a link to her band in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. We did a review of their album and uh, spoiler alert, it's amazing, so you should all give it a listen. <laughs> um, but she's also a DJ and owner uh, with her husband, Gopal, of uh, Goth Night, which is, I believe, the largest goth event in uh, Charlottesville. That's a little bit about her. Uh, Angel, I like to kind of start the show with a little bit of your backstory, just so people can kind of get to know you a bit. So... Uh, you know, if you could kind of tell us about your maybe your first introduction to an alternative scene or a goth scene and uh, how that kind of grew and why you uh, stuck with goth for so long. Yeah, definitely. You know, goth, I kind of fell into. I think um, most people that are in the goth scene and listen to goth music or like the aesthetic kind of have a natural inclination to spookier things and that definitely was the case for me i'm a huge horror movie fan mm. um as well as you know horror literature and all of that and as a kid i um really love the aesthetic that came with that and of course you know in the 80s we had this alternative culture you know we had a lot of punk and goth and all of this stuff getting integrated into horror movies and so um that definitely had a huge impact on me um, actually listening to gothic music, I think I was in my teens, um, when I first got introduced, ironically, which is, I don't think everyone's, um, first introduction, but I started getting into legendary pink dots and that was oh. my, uh, yeah. And so that was my kind of introduction to something a bit different. And, uh, then Susie Sue Bauhaus, you know, the, the, the traditional, Classic mm. bands, of course, The Cure, which I, you know, love till this day. But yeah, all those bands followed. Um, and I think that kind of set the tone a little bit for my personal preferences as far as like really having kind of an experimental, quirky edge to gothic music mm. because of the legendary Pink Dots. I mean, there's there's no right. denying how, yeah. how experimental they are. So yeah, I, I also had a lot of influence from like the rockabilly and psychabilly scenes as well. Um, having uh, been, you know, I'm from California originally. And so those scenes are really healthy over there. And there's a bit of crossover, I would say. There's actually a gothabilly, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But uh, yeah, so it kind of all fell under the same blanket for me. And I remember being, mm, I think I was maybe a freshman in high school. I was at a new high school and someone had said, hey, like, who's that new goth chick <laughs> <laughs> in class? And it was the first time that I'd ever been identified or, you know, thought of myself in that way. And right. uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I just kind of fell into it and I loved it. And, um, you know, I uh, have this project with my husband and that is really awesome because not only do we get to see our own scenes but you know we get to travel and see different communities and I you know with with the Gossi and it's really amazing because it really is a community thing yeah. and uh, with our own club night you know that's something that we really uh was really focused on is making sure it was a safe space 
where we, you know, had it actually be goth, which... Uh, mm. <laughs> I mean, if it says goth night, you kind of can't You kind of have to that. live up to a standard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's what we wanted to do, you know, and it's a risk because yeah. there are a lot of people out there that are like, all right, you know, let's put this to the test. How goth are you? Right, and, yeah. you know, I, I definitely have some fun with it and I spin things that you would never think of spinning on a dance floor, but um, we stay true to our core. Uh, we just had a Facebook review and it sounds so silly, but it was really, uh, it was really sweet. This person who had, you know, been to several, you know, goth clubs in Charlottesville over the years, he said, you know, this is the first one where I walked in and it was actually a goth club and it wasn't <laughs> EDM. Yes. Yeah. And I was uh. like, all right, so I know we're doing something right here. But yeah, so it, it's just grown over the years. And, uh, you know, I'll, we'll talk more about goth night. But that 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 really has um, I think that really has my gothy heart is goth night. The way that we uh, express community, we take care of each other, the bands that we have coming in, the aesthetic, all of it. It's just just really killer. Were you? Uh... I've, I've, uh, if I remember correctly, because I read that article that there was a really great article that came out about it that you guys were both quoted in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, is it a revival of an, of a night from the nineties or is it in, just in the same venue or? Yeah. So, um, like that? so back in, I'd say, um, mid to late nineties, um, my husband Gopal and, um, his good friend, Andy Dean, who, um, mm. They founded Bella Morte together. Uh, they ran a club here in town called The Dawning. And oh, right. uh, okay, yeah. yeah, it was it was uh, pretty well known. And it was very much in the same vein as Goth Night um, in regards to, you know, really supporting local musicians and, you know, having that com uh, community uh, sense of feeling. And uh, that eventually over time went through different owners and, you know, they were all really wonderful. Some of them are still a part of, uh, well, what we're doing at Goth Night now. Um, but eventually that faded out and we had a couple of different incarnations uh, since then for an alternative, you know, gothic night. But uh, Goth Night has really kind of solidified that. There's been a really big need, I think in our community for a gothic and alternative place for people to go. And especially with the way that things are going, you know, in our country and, you know, in our state and all of that, people just really need a place where they can drop all their shit at the door, basically, and just go have fun and dance for a few hours and just be around people that want to be there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, ran <laughs> random question, just real quick, going back to the, uh, you mentioned you were a horror movie fan. Yeah. Have you, I had this experience and maybe it's just me, but, uh, cause I'm also a huge horror movie fan, but ever since, um, my son is, is four now. Mm -hmm. And ever since, uh, he was maybe one or two, I just, I'm not able to watch horror films where there's kids in them that get hurt or like are involved in, in whatever's going on. And I don't know if that's just me, but it's just, I, it's kind of ruined all those <laughs> films for like the new it trailer. Yeah. I was like, Oh no, not yeah, <laughs> stop yeah. hurting the kids. Yeah. You know, I, it, I, as a parent, it's definitely one of those things where when you have someone told me once someone that had multiple children, they said for each child that you have, there's not a separation between them. Each one gets a piece of your heart. Hmm. And I really think, uh, you know, I feel that way with my son. Like, you know, he has a piece of my heart and it really kind of opens and softens you in a way. And so, yeah, I, yeah. you know, I hear you. Like, I've seen some of the most, you know, intense, horror, brutal, you know, movies. But yeah. um, we were, my husband and I were watching uh, Road Warrior the other day. Not and, <laughs> you know, the little feral child with the boomerang, it just like, I was just like yeah. bawling where I never would have before. <laughs> I was just like, oh, that poor child. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, uh, yeah, it definitely softens you, I think, as a person. Yeah. Um, all right. So, well, real quick, I, I wanted to, uh, so I was reading this uh, paper a friend of mine sent to me that was published not that long ago, and it was about the... Uh, medusa club in chicago in the it was from like i think mid 80s to or to like 93 or something like that it was this huge like famous club uh alternative club it was like all you know 
everything goth techno um all the weird stuff combined and there's this interesting portion of it that was kind of talking about the club community and how important it was in the 80s to what we have now and so i thought this might be interesting to get your take on since you are currently running an event um to see if you agree with it or if you have any thoughts on it so just this is one paragraph here i wanted to read uh and she says ostensibly 1980s era teenagers were the last generation of young people to value physical spaces like Medusa's as fully integral to developing their individual identities and sensibilities. While some young people still do frequent nightclubs, current reports suggest that millennials are less interested in them. Uh, Today's teenagers and young adults often use virtual spaces for uh, sociality and dialogue uh, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and for mediated forms of entertainment like music and uh, music videos that would have traditionally been provided by nightclubs. Uh, before, the digital, before the digital age, young people were much more reliant on physical sites for such engagement and activities. For so many people, nightclubs and music venues are the source of a lifetime's music taste, best friends, and vivid memories. Mm. So it's, it's kind of this idea that the... And I, I'm not sure if they're necessarily making a value judgment about the the internet culture, but this idea that uh, club you know communities are not as important anymore, and and people aren't connecting in a physical space or getting their music or you know friendships and that kind of thing anymore. Mm. Yeah, um, there's no denying that social media has like completely consumed our lives. I mean, yeah. I don't I can't think of the last time I didn't go a day without being on social media. Um So I definitely understand that point. You know, I th- I feel that the youth, the teenagers, the, you know, early adults, they are the lifeblood to any scene. So if you see a scene doing well, it's because they're there. <laughs> right. Because, you know, we, we, we have a lot of veterans. We have a lot of people that have been in the scene. But, you know, the youth is, that's where the energy's at. That's, that's where, you know, you, you, see, you see scenes maintain or you see scene, scenes thrive. You know, that's the difference is right. having the, uh, the youth there. And, uh, you know, for, for uh, my club personally, I mean, we get, we get new people in all the time. We, you know, we get kids that travel an hour um, just mm. to be there. You know, people that, you know, we, we get young goths and alternatives and jocks and all types of people that just need something like that. I think that's a, you know, something mm. that's a drive in a lot of youth is, um, is having an alternative space to hang out where the kind of rules and constructs of daily life kind of dissipate a little bit and they can just kind of hang out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I'd actually have to disagree with that from my own perspective. I mean, I see, you know, I see the chat rooms and I see the, the, um, the, you know, social media influence and all of that, but I think that's more so because maybe people don't have a physical space in their area and they're kind of reaching out because that's what I hear a lot um, from people that use, you know, online forums um, to to satiate that need is because they don't have it around. Um, But yeah, the the youth and, you know, personally in our scene in Charlottesville, it's it's great. I think that our biggest hurdle is just getting the word out because people are so absorbed in social media and things like that. You know, they're maybe not looking at the flyer board as much as they would have, you know, 15 years ago. Right. Um, So that's that's the biggest hurdle is just getting it in front of them, getting their attention, because once we do that, um, I think the impact is still, you know, still the same as it, you know, has has been for however long it's um you know i don't think i could be wrong but i don't think that that's ever gonna change from seeing the way that alternative culture influences youth you know i don't and hearing you know all different generations of people and how that alternative you know lifestyle or club or whatever influenced their youth and they're still caring i was just talking to a security guard 
at my job and um, he was, you know, he was sitting there talking to me about how he saw the cure in 89 and, mm -hmm. you know, he was just sitting there and we were just talking about the cure and Joy Division and all the classic bands and, you know, this guy was, I don't know, mid to late 50s, early 60s. And, uh, you know, tying back into that, you know, article that we'll be discussing later too yeah. is, you know, that, that is still at their core. That never changes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, sim yeah. Similar to what you were saying, uh, my normal co-host, uh, Mark, he, his scene is in Nashville and uh, oh, yeah. th their event is only once a month, I believe the one that he goes to at least, but he tells me he drives yeah, yeah. two hours one way every month just to go to that. Yeah, that one so, is great. It's a uh, fascination street run by a good friend of mine, Ichabod. Um, that, oh, cool. yeah, that, that club, um, that the Nashville goth scene, it, it's amazing what they have done. Um, it's an incredible scene. Nashville's an incredible place anyways. Um, but yeah, that's a really, really great scene. And yeah, they, you know, we have someone that, uh, is a promoter actually, and he drives about three hours every Tuesday oh, and he's wow. there every Tuesday and then he's got to drive back. Right. So once we're yeah. closed at midnight, yeah. he's not home till 3 a.m., yeah. 3 30. So yeah, people need it. You know, they'll, they'll drive for it too, if they know about it. Yeah, uh, I think the, uh, go ahead. Yeah. the, the writer of that paper, I, I'd be curious where they were getting their, I guess their data from on that, because I know just looking I, at the scene in Chicago, you you want, go ahead. Uh, that's fine. But just looking at the scene in Chicago, I mean, there's definitely a drive. Both Sarah and Jean-Luc really try to put on all ages events. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the only reason you want to do that, because you're not making alcohol money there, is yeah. to involve the younger people. But if there was no demand for that, they wouldn't be putting on those events. They'd simply do a regular club event and have the drinking adults come in and the yeah. old people coming in from, you know, from the historical 80s and 90s. Yeah, and it would be a stagnant scene. So you know, I agree with Angel that it is the youth that are the lifeblood of the scene, and they are still coming in. And right. I think that you know what you see online is you do see those very busy social media hubs, and part of that is because you've got an even larger crowd. I mean, an all ages club can only get so many. But as we've already mentioned, you've got people who aren't near a club, are unable yeah. to or unwilling to drive the two, three, or maybe even eight to 12 hours, depending on how out of the loop yeah. they are. Yeah. Um, but you also have people who are under 18. You've got 13, 14, 15 year olds who are just getting into the scene. They need a place to communicate with. You've got the elder goth community that can't make it out because of parental responsibilities, but they still want to keep a hand in. So they're involved in recording videos or staying up in forums or doing podcasts. Uh, <laughs> so you've got plenty of people who are needing to use those resources, but I think the the desire to have a physical space, a club space, a space to go is still, you know, at the in all ages of that spectrum, it's still a, a big drive. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, something that I didn't mention before that I think is a, a pretty important point is, you know, with a lot of the youth too, um, especially the young ones that aren't driving yet that, uh, you know, have to ask, ask their parents permission, you know, to get a yeah. ride somewhere or let them know, you know, the, the internet's liberating. They can yes. be themselves. Yeah. They can, they can look at what they want to, you know, I, uh, had a girl the other day that came into my work and, you know, she had very sheepishly had a flyer in her hand for our next show. And, um, uh, her mom was with her and I was like, oh, I see that you have a flyer there. I was telling her a little bit about the show and uh, I was like, I hope to see you there. And, you know, her mom just gave her a look of that is not going to happen, you know. <laughs> and so it is. It's that, too, you know, that that um, being afraid to tell your parents, hey, like, I, I think yeah. I'm into this. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that's something that, you know, at Goth Night 2, we actually encourage. We've had children there from, you know, seven, eight years old all oh, the way wow. up. You know, if they can if they can handle the music, if it's not too much on their ears, then yeah. we, we say bring them because, you know, we strive to have a safe place where they can see an alternative culture. And so mm -hmm. we definitely welcome kids to come and kind of check it out for themselves. That's really interesting because I don't honestly, I don't remember if I was going to bring this up during the article, but that's one of the uh areas of research within academia when they're looking at aging subcultures mm -hmm. is uh this kind of idea that 
usually they they reference uh, Whitby Gothic Weekend, mm-hmm. uh, but this idea that these traditionally uh, younger spaces that were rowdy and you know stay up till the sun comes up drinking and that kind of thing have turned into or at least incorporated uh, family friendly elements because you do have generations of people uh, bringing bringing their kids so like it would be goth weekend they'll have shops that have like children themed gothic clothing they have events going on that are for kids and adults and uh it is it's inter- it's crazy that uh that's going on over there with you guys as well because i right. I do think that is a, a direction that it's heading in but yeah well you know like we're parents right so right. Yeah. <laughs> you know we we have that and for for us specifically with goth night and it's not just you know me and gopal it's um a lot of the people on the crew they understand and recognize how impactful their own exposure to the goth scene was mm. and you know they want to give back they want to let kids know it's okay. You don't have to, you know, suppress this. There are other people like you. Again, like, you know, kind of one of the cores of the goth scene is that that unification and that acceptance for your, you know, quirkiness or whatever you want to call it, you know, and letting yeah. kids know early on so they don't have to deal with years of n- not understanding themselves or conflict right. or shame or any of that. Yeah. So, uh, Any final thoughts, Trey, before we move on here? Nope, I'm good. All right, so that means we're going to jump into the new segment called Goth Word of the Month. Uh, If you are unaware, this is uh, basically this new thing I'm experimenting with where I open the book Encyclopedia Gothica to a random page and hilarity ensues or it falls flat and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to open this up here. And uh, this month, the goth word is uh, Carpe Noctum. Uh, And it says, American Magazine published from 1993 to 2000. Uh, The name translates from Latin to Seize the Night. It was a glossy zine with significant distribution. It covered music, film, books, and art from the dark side, interviewing big names in then underground cultures from Clive Barker to Diamanda Galas. Uh, as well as unknown at the time musician, magician, Chris Angel. (laughs) Jeez, I haven't thought about Chris Angel in years. Probably. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, Featuring original fiction and art, including the earliest publication of Yuan Vasquez's comic, Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Yeah, I had a couple of, I did have a couple of issues of that. Yep. I don't anymore. I don't have any of my old zine type things unfortunately i don't know where they went or what happened to them or when i decided to get rid of them Mm. or if i even did or if they just got lost in a shuffle of moves at some point but yeah carpe noctum was one of the magazines that i had probably two or three issues it wasn't like i had subscribed to it for ages but i did have some was that a a thing for you angel when you were trying to find a community is getting magazines and stuff like that uh before the internet Yeah, magazines weren't really so much. I think because of, um, I think the magazines kind of actually died out by the time I was Mm. coming up. So I had early internet. I think most of my, again, early exposure, like my best um, or my, you know, the most influential was actually media. And I I kind of feel like, I was the 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 goth kid and then people around me started <clears throat> um looking more into, you know, what goth was and then of course eventually I found my peoples and my scene, but um yeah, I uh, I have actually yeah, I know, I know of that magazine well and a lot of of course the people that were featured in it. I I mean, I have a, all of the Johnny the Homicidal Maniacs and a few <laughs> of the spin-offs signed because I mean, how can you not but uh yeah yeah it it was definitely an influential magazine i think um i think we actually might have an issue or two of it still in storage <clears throat> yeah i missed out the whole, on the whole johnny the homicidal maniac thing but that was mostly because my parents were so restrictive about what i could and couldn't find but well, it was also a little before my time i think too 
Yeah, so interestingly enough, actually, I found out about it because I we in high school we used to do this like weekly karaoke and um oh, ra wow. random fact, I was actually in ROTC, so it was a bunch of my ROTC <laughs> friends. I know, right? Figure that one out. <laughs> um so uh yeah, so we had just gone to this karaoke and, you know, one of the people randomly was like, hey, have you ever read this comic, Johnny the Homicidal Maniac? And I said, no, but based off of the title, I think yeah. I'm going to love it. Like, <laughs> let me borrow it. And uh, it was actually um, like the graphic novel version where all, I think, eight or however many comics there are, are you know, consolidated. Mm -hmm. And I read through it and I just, I couldn't stop reading. <laughs> I was like, all right, I love this right up my alley. So I had that and I think he did a, I feel sick and squee and all of that. Yeah. Ironically enough though, I wasn't, um, I mean, I think it's a fun show, but I wasn't a huge Invader Zim. I like, I think I was too, I think it came after the fact Invader Zim. So I kind of missed all of that, but I guess they're rebooting it. So, oh yeah, I did hear I, that. I mean, I love Invader Zim, so I think it's a, a great show. I mean, don't I get me can't wait to see him. Don't get me wrong. When he's like screams at like my taquitos or whatever, <laughs> I, I crack up every time. But I didn't catch it while it was like going. So, uh, all right. Well, with that, let's go ahead and jump into the news. If this boy did this, and the gothic, you know, stuff that went around it, and the motive and everything, don't we all sort of want to know? That could be our teenager. That could be our kid doing that. How, how could that possibly happen? Being described as being involved with the goth movement, but uh, what exactly is that? We kind of know it when we see it, but uh, <laughs> some aspects of a goth lifestyle provoke. Could they provoke such a murder? So this month, uh, we're going to be talking about an article titled Elder Goths, When Growing Up Doesn't Mean Abandoning Your Favorite Youth Culture. Uh, interesting that they still call it a youth culture in the title, but uh, let's let's get into this here and see what they have to say. Uh, so it starts off by saying Jillian Venters, who also goes by the Lady of the Manners, has been a goth for most of her life, which means that she's identified as a goth for nearly as long as it's been an identity. She recalls watching the subculture evolve out of its heyday in the 80s. Uh, she says, quote, almost all of the images are of people in their teens or 20s. You have these wafy, incredible, incredibly perfect skinned little goth girls running around graveyards and looking immaculate. Today, she lives in Seattle and runs the popular goth vlog or blog, uh, Gothic Charm School, which is billed on its homepage as an essential guide for goths and those who love them. Since she's somewhat of an expert in the field, women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, or elder goths, as she calls them, will occasionally email her with questions about what happens when you're no longer in your teens and 20s, but still running around graveyards, at least metaphorically. Uh, some elder goths ask her about the best eyeliner for crow's feet. Others wonder when to discontinue using black number one. Uh, she, sa she says a lot of them are asking if they're too old to be visibly goth. Um, so uh, there's a couple interesting things there. Um, first of all, this idea that, um, you can, that you can still age out of goth, I guess that comes from calling it a youth culture. And also this little kind of nitpick thing that I have with Jillian, which is where she says being, she defines elder goth as how old you are, uh, which is just kind of this weird thing I have because I know people who have gotten into goth actually in their 40s and 50s um, so I think elder goth is kind of a more of a status that you attain after being in goth for a long time but yeah it's more uh, how long you've been in the scene rather than how old you explicitly are though that does tend to correlate with how old right, you are to yeah. some degree I mean you're not going to be a 10 year old elder goth even if you got into the <laughs> scene you know, when you first reach some sort of degree of sentience at around two. two <laughs> I totally years. think Link is going to be a 10 year old elder goth. I'm just I saying. I mean, I painted <laughs> his toes as soon as he came out with black Yeah, pretty polish, much. So. <laughs> uh, but you can't start counting till he chooses to paint his toes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts about, um, I mean, or do you run into this idea that uh, you're either in goth or in your personal lives about. Um, you should, you know, you're at a certain age, you should kind of settle down and, and kind of phase out of the thing that you're into. I think it's really based off of the individual. Um, 
you know, I think after a certain point, you know, maybe mm, 40s, mid 40s, um, things start slowing down. But I think that's more of a physical um, right. thing and, you know, hormonal and all of that. Yeah. Um, but then again, you know, I I have friends who are musicians who are in their 40s and they're jumping around and they're still being crazy and like touring <laughs> and doing all kinds yeah. of fun stuff. So, um, and honestly, I think those that have slowed down too would still be doing what the, you know, other were, you know, if it weren't for, you know, physical or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. be the be the case. Um, yeah, uh, you know, as far as like the elder goth thing, I, I think for me personally, I, I try to stay away from that a little bit. But um, my personal definition of an elder goth is really just their presence. Like you can tell the people that have that deep knowledge and wisdom and the way that they carry themselves. So it's not really so much an age thing for me personally, but um, more so of a uh, experience, I think. <clears throat> yeah. which ties so, back into how long you've been in and you know all right, of that right <clears throat> yeah for me as far as the whole idea <clears throat> that you know you're getting pressure from the outside that you know oh you shouldn't be involved in this community because it's for kids or teenagers or the rebellious youth or whatever mm. you want to say and as you're like myself almost crossing 40 um you certainly get that from the outside but it's not usually any pressure from others in the scene in my experience i've mm. never seen people in the scene like oh you're too old to be coming out to this club um it's more people outside the the people from the the normal super culture that you know surrounds mm. you that says oh you know between parents or coworkers or just people you interact with you know you need to tone down this or that or you can't be involved with this you have to take things seriously you have to settle down have kids be, you know, a, a corporate drone, make the money, whatever, mm. uh, that sort of social pressure to conform to that, that normal progression of life, which is where the idea that it's a youth culture comes from is this idea that the normal progression of life, at least in our culture, it seems, is you go through being with your parents, and then you have that preteen teenage tug away from what your parents brought you up believing to defining yourself and that's where the youth cultures come in as you're experimenting with all these weird different things to find yourself then you find yourself and apparently you're then expected to internalize it and become a normal <laughs> element of society again and not really proceed with whatever you may have found during that period so that's the normal way things seem to be you know portrayed as supposed to have a run i don't understand it I mean, I can understand the idea of taking that discovery period and merging it with, you know, responsibilities and the aspects of being an adult that are necessities, but that doesn't necessarily mean forsaking it. Right. Yeah. Going back to uh, the not feeling that pressure from inside the culture, I would agree with you. Um, I have read some of the, the research around aging in other uh traditionally what could be called youth cultures and uh, i do think or from what i've read at least there had there is more pressure um to dress your age as the cliche goes in other cultures like straight edge uh, that's a big thing there um, i have an there's an example uh, from this paper I was reading the other day about uh, women who are aging in rave culture. And they, uh, at least in this paper, were, were reporting that um, a lot of the discourse for them revolves around their bodies and how uh, within the culture it, it's no longer appropriate for them to display their bodies in mm. the accepted subculture dress, subcultural dress. Mm -hmm. Um and so I thought, you know, bringing that over to goth, I don't th necessarily think there's that pressure there, but there is still, you know, goth dance can can be sexual and there is mm. some degree of um, idealizing uh, youthful bodies, younger looking people. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there's a lot of uh, discussion around older women and and how they should dress themselves in goth spaces. Um I, don't I, think, know if... I think maybe part of the reason behind that, at least just from what I can think of, is comparing your example of rave culture versus goth culture. 
um, the performative aspect of goth culture, to me at least, just seeing the spectrum has a lot broader range. It's not just skimpy neon right, right, right. or body paint. Right. There's a whole spectrum. And sure, there's plenty of skimpy clothing and goth stuff. There's the low-cut bodices. There's duct tape on your breasts and just a mesh shirt over it. There's plenty of that um, from the female side. There's not as much revealing from the male side, but there still is the just mesh shirt topless thing. Mm. Um, and some people get you know, offended when somebody wears that sort of thing and doesn't have the six pack abs or, mm. you know, the nice firm youthful breasts or whatever it is that, that, you know, comes from the fetishization of youth, um, where I think in some of Ray's culture, there is a little bit more of that fetishization yeah. of the youth yeah. aesthetic and there's less breadth in the performative aspect of it. So there isn't as easily a space for someone who's aging out, whose body isn't meeting whatever the norm for the subculture is to still fit in and be able to dress and have fun without being looked at askance. Yeah. And uh, Angel, going back to what you were saying about uh, physical limitations as you age, um, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's as extreme in goth, uh, but like, other youth cultures like um, b-boy culture uh, mm -hmm. there's you know a big thing where as you know as you get older you can't do the ex really demanding break dancing and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff so but then even in that culture people that you know have been in it since they were kids kind of transition into other roles where they're a mentor or a role model or a dance coach or something like that um, so I think there's always a place um, and I think it's often a respected place because you've kind of put your time in and shown that you're dedicated and, and that's, you know, who you are. But. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, by me mentioning that, it certainly wasn't like an exclusion of, because, you know, we have a very right. healthy, um, um, elder or older, you know, goth scene here as well. And, you know, that that's something that we actually tried catering to as well. You know, we have earlier shows just because, you know, we we understand like we're there. We, uh, we maybe not want to be partying on a Tuesday till 3 a.m., especially <laughs> when you have to get up for work yeah. the next day, you know. So and but I certainly don't think it's a limitation at all. Not in any way, because, you know, I have guys 45, 50s who are hauling speakers and PAs like any, twi yeah, you know, 25 yeah. year old. Plus, they have the knowledge, you know, to actually carry it. Right. So, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'd, I'd say for the goth scene, it's less of a physical limitation, more of a, a scheduling right, slash yeah. real life interfering with your right. recreational life limitation. Definitely. Like you were saying with the weeknight events. Uh, I know there's a ton of events I'd love to go to, be it concerts or the smaller events that play more music that I want to hear and not the big popular EDM nights that happen on weeknights. Mm -hmm. And I find it very difficult when I work a standard, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. job to go out on a weeknight starting at 10 yeah. and, you know, staying till one or two in the morning yeah. and then getting up the next morning. So I don't tend to go to those events, unfortunately. Um, and I don't know if it's abnormal or not, but I do seem to be able to totally shift my awake sleep schedule, which allows me to do those late night events on Fridays and Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So I can go to bed at midnight on a weekday, get up at, right. for my eight o'clock shift, but then on a weekend, leave the house at midnight or so and not come home till 5 AM and survive it. Yeah. Um, but I know that's not true of everybody and I know it's not necessarily good sleep hygiene just in <laughs> general, but i I'm holding on to it and hopefully I can keep doing it, but it, it does become a, a bigger struggle when you've got all these other obligations that press on you. Absolutely. And if you have children in the mix too, I mean, yeah. that will like wipe out your weekday just being so tired from the day, you know? So I'm amazed you guys can do anything to be honest. It, Us like, too. Running at night is insane. <laughs> It's one of those things where we look back every once in a while. I, you know, I look back every once in a while and I'm just like, huh, how did I get through that? <laughs> so, who knows? Um, all right. So Jillian says, we are the first and second generation to age into goth. And we have to stand up and say that there is room for older women in the subculture. Uh, we don't have to conform to that template that we're old. Uh, mm. Venters often reminds women 40 and over that as the progenitors of the goth movement, they are the ones who set the visual standard. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I mean, obviously, I agree with her. Like, I, I of course, everyone is. You're never too old to be goth. I don't know where that kind of. It's it's a shame if that's happening where people are saying, you know, there's no room for you in the subculture. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think it's kind of weird that she says women 40 and over or anyone 40 and over are the ones who are setting the visual standards. Because mm -hmm. I see now especially a lot of the newer types of goth dress are coming from younger people and like Instagram culture and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It feels, it feels more to me like she may have meant they were the ones who because they the were the first standard because they were the first, so they were the ones was... who were making those okay. template though. Frankly, the visual standard, you know, you have to be in your seventies and eighties to really be the true progenitors because right. that, that visual standard has been around since the 50s and 60s with Adam's Family, Munsters, old, right. you know, you know Fleetwood yeah. Mac being listed sometimes as a progenitor for some of the Romantic era styles, um, old Victorian costume dramas for some of that as well. But there's plenty of progenitors from the aesthetic side of things going, heck, way back to the 20s and the start of the uh, silent film era. That was actually a huge touchstone probably because the all black look and the heavy makeup mm. really worked in the black and white milieu to yeah. make things stand out. Oh yeah. That was more of, uh, it's a necessity. Uh, they thing. were, yeah. Working out of what they had rather than going for a specific, look, but you had think, things but... like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Yeah. And that's stuff true. like that for the actual thematic, not just, right. Oh, it has to work with our camera technology. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Or you can just be Susie and then you can do whatever the hell you want and you're still are yeah, the best. I I think um, I ha actually have the article pulled up in front of me. Um, uh, the way that I initially took that statement was that they get to set what they look like as far as how they present themselves at this age. And maybe I'm misunderstanding mm, okay. the way that yeah. she's saying it. Um, but that's what it sounds like to me that, uh, you know, they get to set it. So yeah, to I hell with totally anyone that. who yeah. uh, <laughs> says, you know, dress a certain yeah. way because fuck that. I'll dress whatever yeah. I want. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, exactly. right. from, a, from a scene that values individuality. Absolutely. You, you are the master of your own aesthetic. And if mm -hmm. it fits in with any sort of preconception that outsiders have, great. If not, so what? It's <laughs> your style. Yeah. And people can call it whatever they want from the outside. That's their business. Just dress as you like. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think I think with the onset of you know the internet, we're slowly changing the stereotypes. You know, so I, I was talking about this not quite um, with the um, older women, but of you know goths of color. And I think you did something mm -hmm. on that earlier with Cemetery Confessions. Um, you know, just having a better representation of all of the different. Um, you know, just the diversity in the goth yeah. scene because there's so much and yet we're still kind of fed, you know, the very fair skinned, you know, thin people in the graveyard, as she was saying yeah. in the article. And so yeah. um, I think the Internet really, you know, does kind of help with that because I do, you know, you know, being on there and, you know, being connected to the channels, I do get to see these beautiful elder goths, both, both female and male, not just female as well. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's that cute little photo, I guess, from Whitby of the, I don't know, maybe the couple in their seventies dressed to the nines oh, and yeah, saying, you're yeah. never too old to, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that, and that's of course, you know, getting back to the youth too and they can see oh wow like this isn't just you know you have to be a certain whatever which is kind of awesome bringing that back because that's for me kind of what the goth scene is based in anyways yeah, like you don't yeah. have to be any damn thing any damn age any whatever like yeah. just be you and be weird and that's awesome yeah it's about being transgressive and you know there's the whole androgynous thing so i would think people you know transgender people or genderqueer or you know mm -hmm. anyone would be still celebrated and, and accepted um you know oh yeah definitely participating. and mm -hmm. you know we we personally in our scene you know we we have several transgendered you know lgbtqia people in our community and you know they're yeah. they're a huge part they're a core of our community yeah <laughs> um all right so it says going on here born from the looks of Susie sue Roz williams morticia adams and almost any British Gothic novel from the 19th century, goth style has evolved over the past four decades. From traditional all-black attire, leather jackets, and band t-shirts to variations such as cupcake goth, 
which is uh, what uh, Jillian calls her style. Um, cyber goth, health goth, mall goth. <laughs> Uh, goth embodies an amalgam of different fashions, each tapping into a macabre and often androgynous sensibility. Fashion choices like dark eye makeup, velvet, leather, corsets, and anything with bats are typical signifiers of the goth scene. Mm. Um, so here, this is one of the problems I have with, I'm assuming, someone outside of the culture writing articles about goth because just to pick on one, the health goth thing uh, tends to get lumped in with articles like this just because it has the word goth. And the problem is, even if you ask people in that call themselves health goths, like I just watched a documentary uh, about it that was went up on YouTube recently, um, th- they admit like it it has nothing to do with um, the goth music or the goth culture or anything. It's just a kind of appropriation of the name because they have a monochrome element to the fashion Mm -hmm. um so that and i mean health goth itself like isn't even really around anymore it's kind of been commodified and absorbed by the mainstream really but i mean it started uh, as a joke well it depends who you ask you're right it depends on which i mean there are a couple of people who claim to have started it. i think the west coast people are the ones that claim it's a joke the east coast less so yeah the east coast was i think I think it was was it New York? I don't remember. But one I of the think guys, it was New York. One of the guys who said they started it wrote a, uh, f- like a page, th- uh, thesis on it where it was like really like a lot of academic jargon and stuff uh, that was meant to sound smart. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that that aside. And I'm not a big fan of the cupcake goth uh, mm. thing. But I had uh, actually never heard of that until now. I thought. Um... I've seen a, a few of her videos and stuff. I thought it was more of like a Victorian kind of, um, yeah, but I'm seeing now that's, that it's mostly yeah. a color scheme. Yeah. Um, and Cybergoth is another one where it's kind of like, uh, is this its own, is it its own thing? It kind of developed out of the industrial scene and just, they just right. kind of hung around goths. So they got lumped into it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, otherwise it's, it is got, it's an amalgam. Goth fashion is, a it draws on a bunch of different influences from the past and the present and kind of mixes it all together and makes it spoopy <laughs> basically uh all right so uh goth which emerged from goth rock in the se- oh this is the uh prerequisite um goth came out of uk punk in the 70s paragraph uh, that every article has. Uh, so <laughs> it was initially seen as a youth subculture attracting people in their late teens and early 20s who gravitated towards music with darker, more melodramatic lyrics that expressed their own sense of alienation. It united the strange and unusual and fiercely defiant and formed tribes of like-minded baby bats who loved vampire books and horror films. Um, although the word baby bat and I guess really goth for that matter wasn't around in the... 70s or 80s but it wasn't but i mean it's still the the concept still exists in that people who are new to this scene it just didn't have a well in the 80s everybody was new to the scene (laughs) (laughs) but there are always people who are just coming in versus people who have been doing it for a while there's always going to be that degree of yeah hierarchy and the baby bats are usually the people who are you know the just entering first second third time at, at whatever event um, and then as far as the vampire books, yeah, that was more of a late thing. But the horror movies is 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 solid. And there was still Dracula back then. That's true. Yeah. The book, at least. Right. <laughs> uh, so a two, a two, uh, when was the first? Bram well, Stokers? Nosferatu was, was the first one, Nosferatu. right? They had that a couple was... of, um, yeah. She's saying, sorry, in the late 70s. Yeah, there was definitely some um vampirism going on between mm-hmm. between Nosferatu and there. <laughs> I've yeah. seen I mean the, the, the sort films. of vampy look was a thing throughout the seventies. Well Vampira, right? Like, right? like uh, Plan Nine. Yeah. I mean mm-hmm. that alone. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh man, I forgot about that. That's true. Um okay, so a 2011 study from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences notes that many Goths who enter their 30s, 40s, and 50s struggle to balance personal authenticity with their understanding of age appropriateness. The factors that contributed uh, most to a decrease in extremity of appearance were the increasing importance of work, the establishment of long-term friendships, 
and most of all, the onset of long-term relationships. Mm. According to the study's findings, this is something that uh, Venters is well aware of, and she quickly offers a solution for the goth work balance. She says, one of the things that I always point out to people is that there is a style called corp goth, the taking of normal mainstream clothing and adding a darker twist. She recommends that if women want to maintain a darker look at work, wearing all black has an impact. Even if you're still wearing a button up uh, shirt or blazer, you can also pair your business casuals with subtle subcultural nods of skull themed jewelry. I think that's uh, not really that subtle, but depends on how big they are, I suppose. I mean, a little tiny ear stud, maybe not, but skull rings or a skull necklace. That's, yeah, uh, it's, that subtle. was always that was always something that bugged me about the corp goth style because that's been around for a while. The concept of that, and they always have you know, looking at the examples of it, I'm always like, it's. I mean, you look goth. <laughs> you don't really yeah. look like a business professional to me, but if you can get away with it, then do it. But as someone who does actively do corp goth, there are ways of doing it, and it's really just doing. You know, for at least the male style, you wear a button down shirt, you wear some slacks, they're black, they're dark purple, they're dark red, they're, you know, something in those rich colors, but still the standard uniform. And you can merge that with with colored ties, if that's right, but it's just not wearing the traditional sort of off white slash pale whatever colors that are the common dress shirts. And it can be a pain in the butt to find dress shirts in sort of those bold, darker colors. And that's one of the things that I struggle with a lot, but I do find my brands I like and I uh, get them and I go to work that way. And it, nobody looks at me strangely, but it's got that sort of aesthetic that works for me. Mm-hmm. So what, what about this idea of um, long-term friendships or long-term relationships driving people to dress less extreme? That seems kind of strange to me. Yeah, I think that is, uh, you know, that is where the community is so important. You know, I yeah. think it's a lot of insecurity for people not getting to express them their true self or, you know, wanting companionship and not having anyone else around that looks like them. I mean, how often do you hear that yeah. from people in the goth scene yeah, and, and a lot of alternative scenes? Um, I, you know, I think that's what it is. Cause if you had a solid pack around you where, you know, mm-hmm. people were into the same music, the same looks, the same, all that, I don't know that maybe you would be reaching for the khakis to impress, you know, such and such person. Right. But, uh, yeah. 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 I, I mean, it, it, you could say it's easier to do that in bigger cities. Oh yeah. Um, but I think even now, and maybe that's just because this is you know, social media is a newer thing, but even now with the internet, it seems like it's a way for more isolated goths to have meaningful interactions with people and Mm -hmm. kind of build a social group because you do have, um, you can, you know, FaceTime with people. You can, we used to do, uh, Google Hangouts with just people who were in random places around the world that didn't have a local goth scene. And we would get on every once in a while and just drink and hang out for like five or six hours and just talk about stuff. (laughs) So you you do have that kind of thing. And so I, I think, yeah, I'm not sure where that is coming from exactly, but, uh, I mean, I definitely, I definitely hear, um, you know, what's being said here. And I think somewhere further along, she talks about that in parenthood as well. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I I see that too, you know, people who don't know me, Charlottesville is, you know, a a city. So there are people here who don't actually know me, believe it or not. (laughs) But uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, I'll be at the park or we'll be playing somewhere. And every once in a while, you get that parent, you know, that parent who's like, nah, my my kid can't play with yeah. You and I mean, Kai is dressed like a normal child, but if yeah. they see, you know, spooky lady mom, um, they have their biases, mostly yeah. because they haven't been exposed to it. And because the, again, even though we've broken down so many stereotypes, the, uh, the image that is still given to goth is this imbalanced, you know, self-destructive person in our media. And I loved it that, that, you know, you can find it on YouTube, that interview Voltaire did with Fox news. Mm. Um, he really, he really nailed the, 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 you know, the nail on the head 
And he said, you know, you would find it was a, it was about a um, a shooting with with um, two people that identified themselves as goth or were identified as goth. I don't remember if they self identified, but he said, you know, basically you find this in country, you find this in you know any yeah. other genre. Yet goth is still the one because we like the spooky stuff. Yeah. You know, we're still the one being stereotyped. And you know, I know I, I understand how that can make people not want to express themselves when you're looked upon that way. Yeah. I have had a couple experiences where parents um, told their children not to play with my child. Yeah. Uh, and that was pretty awful. One a funnier experience was when we were at our living at our old, old place uh, to get to the park. I had to walk. We had to walk like about a mile. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got up one morning and walked to the park. And as soon as we got there and I saw the other kids, I realized that I was wearing a combi cry shirt that said drink, fight, fuck and huge letters on the back. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. I have been there. So, so I had to stand <laughs> with my there. back to a tree like the whole time so I yeah. didn't piss anybody off. No, I've totally been there. And, uh, you know, that's the thing when that, you know, when that woman did that, it is, like you said, it's incredibly painful because yeah. you're like, oh, shit, my personal life choices is now affecting my child. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you, you have that moment, I think, as a parent being in this scene where you're like, you know, what decision do I make here? And for me, it was... Well, one, as everyone knows, not everyone's going to like you anyway, right? Yeah. And yeah. I can teach my child how to express themselves and be happy and maybe not be friends with that person if they don't want to be friends with us. They're, I'm, we're always open, but if they decide yeah. that's not what they want to do, that's okay. But at least I can teach him that, you know, because I think self-expression is far more important than making that one friend. Yeah. You know, being true to yourself and not having any pent up anything about not being true to yourself. I think that's far more important than, you know, the little disappointment that comes with not being friends with that person. Right. So. Right. Yeah. From from what I can see, the, the sort of strain or stress between the idea of maintaining, you know, whatever your true self is regarding being a part of a youth subculture and continuing that into adult age and the, how that conflicts with potential long-term relationships, be it with friends, be it with um, romantic partners, things like that. Um, part of it is going to be just a difficulty like you two are expressing of trying to combine that with the responsibilities. And while you may have had friends when you were growing up, just getting into the scene, you had all these great relationships. Yes, you can stay in touch with them. But what happens when you maintain your you know, you're focused on the scene, you're willing to take that step to, to, to resist, I guess, the cultural norm of mm -hmm. acculturation, but your friends are unwilling to, to mm -hmm. do that. They, mm. you know, your former friends, they want to go normal and they find it maybe embarrassing or tough to deal with you. Mm. And yeah, mm. you could say that that doesn't make them true friends, but that's a tough decision that yeah. everybody has to make. Yeah. And not everybody is willing to to make that tough decision yeah. to stick with it mm -hmm. so you can lose friendships that way. And Social groups as... are powerful drivers of mm -hmm. behavior for sure. Oh, absolutely. Right. And then as far as creating new friendships, you know, if, if you've drifted away either because of geographical distance or whatever from your old friends, as you're trying to make new friends, all of a sudden your pool or where you, where you go to meet people has changed unless you are able to get out and go to the clubs regularly and those clubs happen to have people your age because some yeah. scenes have more of a yeah. younger crowd. And it's a little awkward when the 40 year old guy is hanging out with a bunch of 20 year olds outside yeah. of the club. Yeah. Yeah. That that becomes a little awkward. So one, finding people your age can be difficult. And two, you might not be able to get out to the club. So all of a sudden your social outlets are your workmates, uh, the PTA mm, people, yeah. uh, play date people with your kid or other, you know, events. And it's yeah. harder to find subcultural people there. So in those instances, sometimes you have to, to moderate your look, your appearance or whatever. So you can both, you know, be true to yourself, but also not turn off potential good friends mm -hmm. who just are unwilling to take that full blast goth look just off the bat. Mm. I mean, as you yeah. get to know people, hopefully they can come to embrace that and it doesn't become a sort of closeted environment. But, you know, when you're first trying to meet people, that is really, you're, you're digging yourself yeah. a hole a little yeah. bit and making it harder to get that first connection 
if you're off putting right off the bat. So that's I think yeah. I did have that, that happen. Comes from. I did have the ha- the one time uh, when I was dating my wife, uh, we broke up, and I went on I went on a date uh, with this girl that I had talked to at Starbucks, and I had dressed more. N- kind of alternative the few times i'd seen her and she agreed to go out to a movie with me and i showed up in full uh goth gear and i could tell right away she was like what the fuck is happening right now yeah there needs to be a gradual introduction to someone who isn't already in invested in the scene or at least very right. comfortable with it yeah you know i have um for lack of a better word I, you know vanilla friends that i'm very close <laughs> with um which seems really funny using it in this context but it is appropriate um and, uh, you know, f- my approach, and it is certainly not the approach for everyone, but um, I have worked many, many years to come to a place where I'm, I'm totally okay with myself and what I'm doing, and it's awesome. And uh, so what I do is, you know, at work or, you know, wherever I am, I, I look the way that I do. And I have blue hair and piercings and tattoos and, you know, very dramatic makeup. And I just kill them with kindness off the bat. And that's just something that, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have in my personality where I can be very extroverted and, you know, and take that leap, you know, make that step forward in my personality where it sounds like, you know, other people, you know, they may do that by toning down their appearance, you know, to let people come in a little bit more and not be so off, you know, off put by by the physical, you know, whereas for me, they may be off put, but you give someone a big smile and ask them how their day yeah. is doing. And that 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 makes a big impact as well. You know, yeah, so. as an introvert myself, I need to make myself approachable. Yeah, so I hear I, that. I, I definitely I hear generally that. tone down the performative side, but I also don't you know, for me personally, the performative aspect of it is not core to my being. So I don't mm-hmm. need to have, you know, any of those big markers to feel comfortable in myself. I can be right. toned down and still be very happy with mm-hmm. the way I'm presenting myself. And I still come off as weird, but not in the over the top and somewhat scary or at least a little bit off putting, a little bit more of a risk to go up and meet this person kind of way. Sure. Um, so that that helps. And, you know, I also do the kill him with kindness. And that's just the way I happen to be personally. So that's not even an act I have to put on. That's just me being me. Right. Um, but that's how I keep people in. And that's why people, you know, when they find out, you know, I may be a little bit weirder than they thought in any number of ways, I'm still a great guy to hang out with. I still have all these other qualities that appeal to them even if the alternative sides of things are not their cup of tea yeah no i i agree with you it's the same thing for me and i i i seem to find mm-hmm. even with those that may be like a little resistant to it that in time if we get to the point where we can actually communicate and develop it's more so of a fear of curiosity that they have than an outright i don't like this you know what i and even if it's not for them i feel like you know, the rejection comes from being curious and feeling like they're not supposed to be curious about this. This is a bad thing and you shouldn't even think about it kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I lived in Utah for for a few years and I, I lived in a very conservative part of Utah. And, you know, there it was very much cut and dry. We don't like you. You know, mm-hmm. our ch- we're going to hide our children behind us. We're going to walk on the other side of the street. You know, very, very yep. much yep. that discriminatory. Yep. And, um, you know, whether it be because I was working with them or I was just, you know, forced into an environment where they had to be around me, once they got over that, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, and started asking questions, it was, it, it, you know, it was, it was an underlying curiosity. And like, what is this about that I found? So um, I try to think yeah. about that too when meeting people when they're they're rejected like that. It's like oh, this seems like they've got something going on there where they can't handle this for whatever reason. They're bound up, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I've I, I've been to Utah a few times and it's always been a pretty bad experience. It's, they're very Mormon and puritanical, and uh, I did, right. I always. Uh, we've always got my wife and I got shit every time. I know they have a goth scene there, but they absolutely do. Bad. I went there all the time. <clears throat> Killer Area Fifty One. Shout out to those yeah. guys, keeping it strong for as long as they have. Um, yeah, that have, it's in Salt Lake City, Area Fifty One. It's a great, great spot. Have either of you guys seen the movie uh, SLC Punk? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, I still oh, haven't yeah. seen it yet. That's one of my great sins. It's, well, I wouldn't put that as a sin. It's a punk movie, not a goth movie. No, I, I know, but... Dovetail. I think you'll like it, get, uh, Count. You it's will, a, yeah. it's It's great. Yeah, they actually just were filming the second one as I was on my way out of Utah, and I was like, damn, I could have been an extra oh, had I yes. stayed just a little <laughs> bit longer. <laughs> and that one is actually cool. So the second one... Uh, is a continuation. I'm not going to ruin the plot for you or anything. Okay. But it's a continuation of the first one, and the main character in it is actually like romantic goth. Like that's his thing. That's his. Oh. Yeah. So you may need to watch the first one just to see how the second one turns out. All right. So the next time I want to sit down to watch Gypsy eighty three, I'll watch that instead. Right. <laughs> Good call. Um. All right. So I'll skip down a little bit here to uh for time. So let's skip to the parent stuff. Uh, here's a quote: Parenthood does not mean the death of your interests or the death of you as a person i have friends who are goths and who are also parents and they're very adamant about showing their kids that this is who i am these are the things that are important to me i am here for you and i support you uh many an elder goth uh is this about uh yeah many an elder goth who lives in canada Oh, no, not many. Mary, (laughs) an elder goth who lives in Canada, says she grappled with gothdom and motherhood for a few years. After she moved to Ontario in 2000 with her young son, her roughly sleeves and all-black attire posed a challenge to the more colorful dress of mothers in the conservative city. Uh, Quote, I remember one of the mothers saying, are you a goth mom? Uh, And I was like, oh, is uh, is that how you look at me? Uh, She felt self-conscious suddenly and tried to dress more like her new peers. Quote, I never really Mm -hmm. felt, uh, I never really thought about how I dressed until this woman said that, and that made me change my style for a bit. I was trying to fit into the crowd of young moms, but even when I changed my style, I never fit in. Even if you do change your clothes, you can't change what music you listen to or what books you like to read, so you'll never have the common ground with the soccer moms. Mm -hmm. Um. Is that is this a fear for you, Angel? Because I, uh, my son's not old enough. Well, he's gonna. I think we're gonna put him in preschool this year. Mm. But when he starts going to school, I am absolutely terrified of how that interaction is gonna go with that community of other parents, uh, and how they're going to. Because I don't like. I don't want him to make friends with people at school and then. That we meet their parents and they're like, yeah, you can't hang out with that kid anymore. You know, mm. like I, I don't, I don't want that to happen. Um, and I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get into shouting matches about like politics or why we just had a ele- our election a couple of weeks ago and there was some people running on an anti transgender platform because they mm. there's a transgender student at school, like. I, I guess it's an inevitability whether I dress goth or not, but uh, I don't know. Do you have any fears about that? Or do you have any like parent groups, like any alternative parents that you get to hang out with? Or um, You know, we I, I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have several people that are alternative that are parents. I think that's always... Um... Well, one, as a parent, you're going to you're going to be afraid of things anyways, right? You want to provide the best for your child and you're just always terrified of the outcome of any choice that you make. (laughs) And I I also think that, you know, anytime you recognize that you're different from whatever the standard is, you know, in your community or in our country, that that starts to make you feel a little bit fearful, especially with the way that um our uh, you know political side of things have turned and everything that we're seeing in the news and the policies that have been enacted and those abroad as well you know Russia and all of that and uh yeah it does make you a little fearful um i try to look at it as a blessing because the beautiful thing about being in the goth scene especially having the aesthetic side is it of it is it naturally kind of weeds out those people and although, you know, there's there's a risk that, you know, your your child's going to find someone they really love hanging out with and you're going to meet the parents and the parents are going to be like, step away, Satan, you cannot <laughs> hang out with my child anymore. You know, it, it it also opens up a really wonderful opportunity to sit down with your child and 
and talk to the talk to them about why that's happening because I mean that is something they're going to face in the world and I think as parents our biggest asset is communication with our children and explaining to them you know what's going on in the world what are these interactions why did this person not want to you know hang out with me why why is this going on and I feel that we really try to shield and sterilize our children to to knowledge of the outside world and it was something that I was thinking about before we had Kai about our aesthetic you know I was <laughs> I was sitting on the couch and I was pregnant and I was thinking you know like as a kid I I loved horror movies and I was watching horror movies I mean younger than I'm going to mention on on this <laughs> chat I, but uh I couldn't imagine letting Kai watch the yeah. things that I watched right yeah. and I'm sitting there and I look up at the wall and there is this floor to ceiling length poster of mine of Hellraiser <laughs> yeah. and I'm like what am I going to do you know and <sighs> and so I just I try not to, exp I really try to read ch my child and I'm fortunate mm. enough that if something is too scary, he will tell me. And okay. I've had that happen randomly. Although he loves Coraline, which I think yes, should personally scare yeah. the shit out of him. But yeah. apparently Coraline is the great, he really thinks it's so great. Oh, Coraline has the same color hair as mommy. Like oh, nice. he loves yeah. that. And, uh, you know, so I, I really try to gauge his, his, uh, exposure to that, um, and see see how he feels and also explain to him you know what is death what what is going mm. on here what what is all of this and mm. because these are things he's going to face in the world sooner or later and i'd rather have it be a part of life here and there and talk to him about it than have him be 18 and have a shit ton of shock when he goes out into the world and has no idea what's been going on yeah um, so that's, that's probably, you know, that was probably my biggest fear, not so much the interaction with other people because, and I'm a bit of a optimist. So I, I, I feel that, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Things will be good. You will find your people like just, just keep believing in that and that will happen. Um, but my biggest fear was, was the, the, the physical aspect, you know, the horror aspect, the, this, the, that, and mm. I mean, he, he loves it. And every once in a while, you know, he may, because they have this cute little thing on YouTube, these Halloween children songs he loves. Oh, yeah. He and so, like, went through a phase with those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, every once in a while, he may say something, maybe not the most appropriate thing for that <laughs> situation. Like, we were in the bank the other day, and he had a chocolate ice cream, and he just annihilated it. It was everywhere. And he's sitting there in his stroller while we're waiting in line for a full bank, and he goes... It's blood. <laughs> and he just starts laughing, which I have no idea where he got that from. But yeah. uh, I can only blame myself. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, like that happens. But I think because it's such a core part of who I am and I want to show him that you can be happy, like weird stuff. And also the weird stuff is okay. Like, let's sit down and talk about it. You know, I feel like that's the most important thing. So... I could have gone, you know, the route of wearing cardigans and khakis and only watching Daniel Tiger and <laughs> only watching, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever. But um, I, uh, I chose to show him who we are as people and as parents. You know, I, it, it goes hand in hand. Hey, what? You just wanted to say hi? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Thanks for the hug. You gotta Aww. go. You gotta go back to bed now, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, he. Uh, oh, shit. I was going to say something and I totally wiped my mind. Something about blood or something about. I don't know. He's he's a really sweet kid, but he's really into, you know, he likes the horror stuff and he likes like uh, there's a video game called Left for Dead where you basically. Oh, yeah. I know Left for Dead. Yeah. Yeah. So he likes playing that with me and he likes doing those kinds of things. But sometimes he. He, at night he'll get really concerned about monsters and stuff so we have to talk to him about uh you know reality and imagination and, and things like that but he's we've yeah. been in situations where we're at a friend's house and he'll be running around yelling like i'm going to kill you and drink your blood <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, uh, okay <laughs> Pretty much. So, That's the reaction I get too. And honestly, even if you had a kid where you only had him watch Daniel Tiger, I mean, those kids are scared of monsters in the dark too. It's an innate fear that yeah. we have as human beings, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I don't know. People are, 
There's always, you every once in a while you get that person that thinks you're raising a psychopath and it's like, well, maybe, but I think he's got about the same chance as anyone else out there raising a psychopath. So I don't think it really makes that big of a difference. Angel, I think we should start a spinoff uh, goth parent podcast. And, I am uh, totally <laughs> about that. <laughs> I like the direction this is going. All right. So let's uh, let me jump to something here because I had I wrote something on Facebook that I wanted to put out there. Um, and I think, Trey, you might appreciate it. But so it's, it was going off of this quote from from the mom we were talking about earlier, where she says, um, it didn't matter what the other moms thought of me anymore. I just went right back to the way I was. I actually feel more comfortable when I dress the way that I want to. It's the outward expressing the inward. So I wrote uh, kind of more academically on this, just a little bit here, which I'll read. Basically, I said, um, an experience. So first of all, an experience that was expressed by several of the people um, that we had on a show about aging in youth cultures previously uh, was very similar to this, where essentially, whether it was for their career or for children, um, they forced themselves to fit into a more normative, homogenized American community. They hated it for however many years that they had to do that. And eventually they came back to goth and expressed that they immediately felt like they were at home again and they were all excited about it all over again. And so I think that this kind of experience speaks to the uh, implicit uh, inveterate and neurological nature of a cultural identity that these tribal markers that are deeply attached to our sense of self are really incredibly robust and they inform our philosophy and our performative behaviors and even stuff like our ontology or our vocations, um, our sense of purpose and meaning and so on and so forth. And our identity is interpolated by our associated cultures, ideologies, so goth ideologies and the venerated values within and those ideologies, and this is just speaking to why cultural identity is so sticky, um, those ideologies and norms usually were already part of who we were, our epistemology, how we came to know what we know. And th thus, our identity as a goth is often compatible with outside interests and worldviews that we already held, which just feeds into how uh, ingrained and how how tied to our social and personal identity it is and mm -hmm. that's why we see people like um, the the christian goth culture will often um, kind of focus on the parts of christianity that synthesize to goths uh, you have people that you ask them what goth is and they'll tie it to some outside philosophy like if they're absurdists or nihilists or or liberals even um, and they kind of craft this uh, syncretism that they call the goth mindset or philosophy so when you pull yourself out of that for and, and and try to abandon it because of like hegemic social dictates outside mass culture telling you you have to be a certain way um you it's impossible to feel fulfilled or to feel like yourself because those types of huge worldview and identity shifts you know which i was trying to show how tight it is to everything else neurologically and, and your identity have to be made out of uh, personal choice and have to gradually change over a period of time uh, because you want to make them, not because someone else is telling you you have to. So if you, anytime you take someone out of their culture and drop them somewhere else and they do it because they feel like they have to for their kids or for their job or whatever, uh, they can adapt to survive, but they're never really going to be happy. And that was... You know, an experience I had when I was uh, I was uh, worked at McDonald's for a period of time and I was a manager. And towards the end of that career, I would pretty much every day I would spend at least five minutes out in the dumpster corral crying because I felt like I was dying on the inside. Uh, so it's just I just wanted to speak to how, you know, and if for some people, if goth is just listening to a certain type of music or expressing themselves in a certain way that's great and you know i don't want to take away from that but i think for a lot of people th whether they realize it or not the identity of who you are socially and as uh, individually is just runs really really deep in your psyche so mm. um yeah i mean 
I, <laughs> I, I definitely agree with that. I think there's a spectrum um, to that where maybe, you know, someone just likes the cure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we go all the way, you know, down to, you know, darkness is like the core of my being and I'm, you know, completely consumed by it and that's where I feel comfortable and, you know, it's just, it permeates every cell of my body yeah. and there's everyone in between. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing because it's not just something that you see in the, um, you know, in the United States or the UK or Germany or, you know, yeah. any of the places where goth is prevalent, you know, you see there's always those people in the shadows, you know, in India, they have monks who meditate on corpses and eat, you know, mm. eat dead people. And um, yeah. for a lack of a better way of saying it, <laughs> perform cannibalism. There we yeah. go. It's, um, and so, um, you know, ritualistic cannibalism and, um, so you always see those people um, in every culture, um, you know, and and um, yeah. So this 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 idea that um, that I I don't know I don't even know what you know the the whole the whole article in its entirety you know the 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 you know women not feeling accepted in in. Um, in the goth scene anymore because it's a youth culture and you know all of that jazz it what well, one it makes me you know super sad that yeah. there are women feeling that way and i'm sure men yeah. as well and you know all of that because i i've found having lived in a you know having lived in communities intentional communities that there is a um prevalent theme of you know the older generation feeling pushed out by the youth and i think yeah. that is a um miscommunication of the excitement and energy that youth are wanting to put mm. towards the scene like yeah i want to do this and i want to do this and i want to take over and um and the youth i think they're they're trying to find their place too which is a lot of times where you absolutely you get kind of the uh what could be termed elitist behavior because they're just trying to assert that they're part of a culture too so there's always going to be that kind of tension there yeah, there's definitely, you know, there's always that, you know, back and forth um, with that. But um, yeah, so getting back to it, you know, that that the 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 goth, well, at least what it represents to me, that that, you know, I posted on uh, one of my social media channels. It was a, it was written as a dictionary um, excerpt, and it said goth, and it said the willingness to see and ability to see beauty where others cannot. And I think that's probably the most accurate general definition for God <laughs> um, when you look back at it, because, you know, we have the modern, you know, we have, you know, what we consider goth, gothic music, the gothic scene, you know, all of that. But I think there's also this deeper underlying um, yeah. compulsion that we all have, you know, some more, some less, but there's that and that supersedes you know what we have going on for the past almost 50 years now yeah you know that that's that's hundreds and hundreds that's that's humanity yeah. you know yeah. that's always been there yeah uh so i'll just jump to the last paragraph here inventor's opinion you're never too old to be goth she encourages women to embrace the idea that with age comes knowledge power and not caring what other people think and with societal pressures on women to be caretakers nurturers and invisible past a certain age venters is determined to take up space encouraging other elder goths to age as visibly and flamboyantly as possible mm. quote uh maybe you think i shouldn't have brilliant brilliant pink and burgundy hair at age 48 whatever that's your opinion i don't care <laughs> That's great. I mean, yeah. that just answers that right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I would say the one thing I would tweak on that is, you know, uh, we not just as goths, but we as human freaking beings, like we are going to hair what other people think about us. That's human nature. You know, we're, we're um, we we need to be in a clan. We need to be in a tribe. It's built into our DNA to have our peoples around yeah. as humans. Yeah. Uh, we're happiest around other people. Numerous yeah. studies show, study after study. And uh, I think the differentiation there for me is not not caring about what other people think, but remembering that ultimately it doesn't matter 
over your own happiness. Your own happiness is number one because at the end of the day, no matter how close you are with such and such person or how important such and such person is in your local community or whatever, you still have to look yourself in the, you know, and you have to look your own face in the mirror before you go to bed, right? You have to, you have to be the one that lays down. You have to be the one with your own thoughts. So if those thoughts are miserable and you feel like crap because you don't have pink and magenta or whatever, sorry, I don't remember her hair colors, but (laughs) whatever her hair colors were if you're you know i have so many women come up to me you know older older women as well you know that that aren't alternative but they're like god i wish i could do that with my hair god i wish you know i wish i could pull that off i could never pull that off and i just tell them you know you can pull it off you pull it off by doing it and if it's something you really love to do then don't wait you know, don't wait because this is what we're here for. You know, yeah. that's what living is about, is about experimenting, expressing yourself. I mean, gosh, as human beings, no matter whether you like spooky stuff or not, art and music are like at the core of our being and a part of that. It's not just, you know, a, you know, com- you know, composition and paintings. It's, it's, it's self-expression. That is art. You know, and if you're not expressing that, you're denying a part of your being, you know, do the hair, get the crazy hair, get a mohawk, get a, gosh, I was watching this tattoo show, I don't remember, one of the ink, whatever the hell. One of the 50 different yeah. tattoo shows. And this woman was 80 years old, went on, went in there and she's like, you know what, I want a tattoo on my shoulder because I've never done it before and I don't yes. want to regret not doing yeah, it. And I was yeah. just like, hell yes, like yeah. do that, do the thing. And yeah. I understand that we have responsibilities and I understand that, you know, there are obligations and, you know, opinions and things like that. But if you are dying inside because you are not expressing yourself, that shit needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, there's a there's a tension between two two aspects here that both of which you'd mentioned, you both had mentioned regarding our sense of well-being as, as human beings and as social creatures. There's the aspect of the tribalism where you got to find your people, you have to mm-hmm. find your tribe and you have to find your group that you're with. And then there's this this idea of the individual expression and being your true self and showing your true self, the tension exists where if performing your true self causes you to be ostracized from the tribe that happens to be around you, Mm because unfortunately we can't always choose our tribe as easily as we might like to. It's becoming easier and easier as travel becomes easier, as the internet allows us to find more niche and niche things. Um, Possibly that actually makes it worse because it makes tribes a little bit more specific and maybe a little more choosy Mm -hmm. and less broadly accepting. But that's Mm -hmm. beside the point. There is still that tension, though, between I want to do me because it makes me happy. But at the same time, I also want to be with people. I want to have a Mm -hmm. tribe. And if I do me, the people around me ostracize me. And so you've got to figure out how to balance those two and how to make it kind of work. And I think that's probably one of the biggest struggles right. for those who are struggling with this aging in a quote unquote youth culture. And that that is, you know, that that's the key word right there is balance. And that is really up to the individual. You know, we can talk circles, you know, all night and, you know, give give out advice, but it's really up to the individual what they're going to do. You know, if like I said, if you're dying inside cuz you don't have that blue hair or green hair or that tattoo and that's that's what you need to be okay, then go do the thing. You know, if you're dying inside because you maybe like some inappropriate movie, behavior, music, whatever that people aren't vibing with, but the most important thing to you are those people, then, you know, that's, you got to decide, like, is, is that the route I want to go? Maybe I need to tone it down a little bit. And that's okay too. You know, I'm not one of those people that, um, I'm like, you You got to dress to the max. Eyeliner and bats and hairspray out the door. You can't be seen without it. It's definitely not what I'm about. What I'm about, number one, is happiness. Like, you have to have that internal joy, whatever your decisions are. I honestly don't care either way, you know, whether, whether someone, you know, I mean, like at our club, you know, we have people that dress to the nines and we have, like, regular people off the street, never even heard a goth. But it makes them happy to be there. They're happy to dance. You know, it, it, and it's awesome, too, because they bring that element in. So, you know, find, again, finding that balance and just not lying to yourself, figuring out what it is that you need and you want and following that, whatever it is, because eventually you'll find your tribe. 
you know, what, whatever it may be, whether it's being, you know, the, the, the vanilla or being the goth or anywhere in between, like those people will gravitate to you once you stop, you know, exacerbating that internal conflict and just accept whatever it is that you're needing. Album review. Um, all right, so I could not find any information about this band. Nice. Uh, and I didn't I, I didn't I spend it. a ton of time looking, but either they're super obscure or I just suck at Google. I don't know. Ultra underground. But uh, we are reviewing <laughs> the album called Better Than Death by the band New Today. And I'm going to play a track from them. Uh, for you guys and that is called Commendation.
Okay, so, um, tr well, Trey, why don't you uh, tell me your thoughts about this album? All right. Um, I mean, I it sounds like, based on what you guys were saying earlier, that I probably listened to this the most of anybody. Um, I did only start yeah, listening probably. to it today, <laughs> but I put it on my phone when I did my drive out to the Easter thing, so I listened to it both out to Easter and then back, so I was able to listen to it all the way through a couple of times, and okay. then just had it playing a, a while at home as well. So I've listened to it all the way through a few times. Um, I'm not going to do a good job of replacing Mark here. I'm not going to do a track by track or anything like that. Um, it's more just general overviews. And overall, it was a nice nostalgia trip, but I found it kind of boring. Mm. Um, it was, I mean, it reminded me a lot of some of the, you know, old goth box stuff that I was listening to when I first got into it. It's definitely got a very old... You know, early 80s goth, mm -hmm. the, where goth comes out of post-punk. It's got a lot of Joy Division action going on. Um, some vocal stylings of Peter Murphy a little bit, Andrew Eldritch a little bit. Um, so it's got a lot of that. But that's kind of what made it boring to me is that I've heard that all before. Mm. And if I want to hear that stuff, I kind of want to just go back to the original bands. Um, mm. As far as just... Listening through it, I found the first five tracks to be very, very the same. Um, they all had that straight, you know, straight ahead rhythm, you know, solid eighth note repeating bass line. Um, the drums, the drums are actually probably the most interesting and changing bits of it. Um, the vocals were totally buried. Um, they had basically a constant reverb on all instruments that didn't really shift or change. So the, dyna the dynamism wasn't really there. I didn't look into the lyrics, so I couldn't say that it had great poetry, but the ones that I was hearing, um, a lot of sloganing, a lot of repeated phrases, not mm. so much a storytelling or, you know, any sort of ev evolution in the lyrical content that I was hearing. But again, with it being so buried and I wasn't giving enough concentration to just try to, you know, pull apart the threads of the lyrical content to really yeah. judge that. Um, I found tracks six, seven, and eight to be the most interesting. That doesn't necessarily mean I liked them a lot, but they, they <laughs> varied. Um, uh, seven was probably my favorite commendation mm -hmm. um, because I found it to be both the most varied and interesting, or maybe not the most different from the others, but it was different enough and it had a lot of interest to recommend it. The most different was probably the previous track, Savior.com, where they totally changed up the bass line. Yeah. Um, not a great slap bassist, but at least it was something different. Um, and they were trying a little bit of different stuff in there. So I found that one interesting from that perspective, but I didn't like it as a track that much. Um, and then the years was also another interesting variation, but then the last two tracks kind of went back to their original, their original theme. So mm. overall, I mean, I found it enjoyable. It was nice, but it didn't really grab my interest. And as I've expressed in previous album reviews, one of the main things I look for in music is something that is new, different, exotic, whatever. So I don't, my tastes don't run to things that are comfortable because I've heard them before. I get bored of that really quickly. And I want something that really pushes the boundaries of what I'm used to and seems foreign and strange and unusual. And that's exciting to me. Mm. This didn't scratch that itch at all. But it's a great nostalgia trip. It does touch on a lot of those keystone, those key points from old classic, early goth coming right out of the post-punk movement. So if you're into that sort of thing, um, that's great, but not really my style of things. But, you know, I'd say probably maybe two out of five, two and a half. Okay. Um, yeah, well, me, on the other hand, I love hearing the same shit over and over. So I, uh, um, I actually did dig the album. Uh, I did, I will agree. I did kind of find it kind of boring, uh, be just, or maybe more monotonous because it was kind of the same thing through most of the album. Uh, but I mean, it was reminiscent of like joy division to me and, you know, really the old school sound. There were a couple tracks where I felt like they had more of a, uh, more of a take on the post-punk sound that you're hearing from newer bands now. There's, I don't really know how to describe it because I'm not a musician, but there's a specific uh, new post-punk sound, I think at least, that I'm hearing from from newer bands. So I kind of like that. Uh, but I'd like, I don't know, I liked it. I like the feel of it. I hate 
I, my opinion might change because I, I, like you alluded to, I only listened through this once while I was at work and I tried to catch a few more tracks. Like that was a while ago. I tried to catch a few more tracks in the last few days, but I, I don't like reviewing an album without really sitting down and listening to it for a long time. So take what I have to say with a grain of salt. Um, I did read a few of the lyrics and I thought they were okay. Nothing mind blowing, uh, but I thought they were interesting at least. Um, if you if you actually look at the Bandcamp page for anyone who wants to follow the link uh, in the show notes, you can actually uh, l- read the lyrics for each of the songs. Um, so and you can you know listen through it also to decide if you like it if you want to buy it. Um, I'm gonna give it more of a. I'm actually gonna give it a 3.5, uh, which is just uh, you know slightly above average. I thought the instrumentation and the composition and the uh, production was pretty good. And I like the sound in general. I like the vocals. Um, and I just, I don't know, I can't get enough of the old school post-punk sound. So even though, even maybe it wasn't the absolute, you know, pinnacle and that's really always going to be the eighties bands for me. I don't think you can get away from that. Um, I yeah. still enjoyed it and I thought it was a fun listen. So if you're into that kind of old school sound, I would recommend you at least check it out. Mm. Yeah, I um I got to go through it a little bit. I think I probably uh got to listen to it as much as you did count. Um sure. but uh yeah, I I kind of feel the same way a little bit of both from what you guys are saying. I I definitely think it captured that like traditional uh gothic rock post punk sound from the 80s but it didn't didn't excite me and actually ironically commendation mm. was the track that stood out to me too because it was the yeah. one that was kind of like for lack of a better word it was the banger track right it was the track yeah. that's like yeah. oh hi there track yes i will listen to you um <laughs> yes the rest of it kind of just i think it, you know it kind of felt like study music to me um, it was something you had yeah. in the background, very melodic, very cool, yeah. like very well produced. The 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 instruments were all on point, but it didn't really um capture my uh attention so much. And you know, wasn't something spicy. Wasn't spicy. And something <laughs> that I uh we were we did a panel, a state of the goth scene panel at Dragon Con in Oh, what? Twenty fourteen. <laughs> Is this available online? Uh no, I don't oh. think I don't know. Probably for the best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, um, Ichabod, the one that runs the uh, night in uh, Nashville, he runs State of the Goth Scene at Dragon Con. And you might actually need to get oh, in touch man. with that guy about getting some video or something of that because that, that's a great panel to see. Um, but anywho, yeah, someone, I think he asked me, you know, what do you think the future of the goth scene is? And at the time, you know, this is 2014, so like uh, we were getting some really good goth revival bands. And I told him, I was like, yeah. you know, we, uh, we're we always going to have those bands that are going to do killer, you know, renditions of classic 80s goth. I was like, you know, she passed away. Perfect mm-hmm. example. Like yeah. we're always going to have that. But the thing that catches me, and again, this may be tying back to that legendary Pink Dots, is the, you know, experimentation. I like seeing it. I love seeing the Witch House stuff come out. I know there are yeah. a lot of goths that were like, fuck that noise. Yeah. But I yeah. really enjoyed it. You know, I really liked seeing how how goth can permeate to all these different cultures, you know, into hip hop and, you know, country like, um, uh, 16 horsepower, you know, and, um, I don't know what um, that is. I'm I, I'll send up. you, I'll send you a, what's their, their, their hit black soul choir. I think that's, that's them. Okay. And it, it's great. I mean, it's so cool to see the spooky, like getting out to all the different genres and all the, you know, and like the health goth thing, you know, that, well, there's no real music associated with that, so Well well but even so occasion. Well, even so, like it's just you know, I, I'm not even looking at it from a music standpoint at this point. It's just the <clears throat> um the permeation into a culture and I know that a lot of people I mean, I, I think it's pretty funny myself too, but I always kind of take a nice sigh of relief because any time that we're in the media like that, it makes people I feel a little bit more open. 
you know, when they're seeing, oh, yeah, this is a fashion statement. This is great. It's like, oh, thank God, I'm not going to get like jumped or <laughs> something today. Not saying that it's that bad anymore. But, you know, <laughs> there's always that residual. I hope I don't get jumped in this certain area, you know. And so anytime that stuff yeah. comes out, I'm really happy about it. But going back to the music, um, yeah, it, it's a... Uh, it's really cool for me, I think. And it's just a personal opinion, but I really like seeing the ex experimentation. I, I like seeing something new. Yeah. I think that that was a really lovely part of Goth's Roots was the quirky, weird, like, what the hell are we doing here? You know, the Noy Bouton of, you know, all the different bands, you know, and the, of course that's yeah. industrial, yeah. but still, yeah. you know, there, it was just like a, it was a melting pot of, emotion and certain aesthetics and all of this beautiful music came out and i you know i like seeing that and i not to get me wrong like i, I like the formula you know rosetta stone is one of my favorite bands but yeah. if you try to tell me that they didn't rip off sisters of mercy <laughs> i'm gonna fight you on it because <laughs> they obviously did yeah. um you know, so, yeah, and it's, so going back to the album, I think I would probably give it a three and a half as well. They, As far as recreating that gothic post-punk sound from the 80s, they nailed it. The production yeah. is clean, everything is well-balanced, the instruments are there, the sound is there, it's awesome. As far as that spicy, as you, <laughs> <laughs> as you referred to it, yeah, that... That uh, that wasn't there for me so much. But again, track seven, that commendation, I really did like that track. It, it, and again, yeah. though, because it had that introduction that was like, oh, hello. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. going on here? So. Man, you you said like 15 different tangents that I want to follow up on, but I'm <laughs> way over time now. So we'll just um, tell us, uh, tell us uh, real quick before we go. Um well, I guess if you want to say a little bit about Guild of and like what, you know, what it is. So for people who don't know and and uh, where we can find that online. Absolutely. Yeah. Guild of Morn is a fairy tale themed gothic rock project uh, with myself and my husband. Uh, the best way to put it is we dress up in armor like Lord of the Ring characters. We sing about fairy tales, the gothic rock music. Um, influenced, obviously, by Faith in the Muse, uh, Susie Sue, Early Cure, uh, all that jazz, Sisters of Mercy. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, uh, you know, slash Guild the Morn. Same with YouTube, Spotify, iTunes. We're on all the channels. You can just Google us. We'll pop up. Um, also goth night Charlottesville. It's a weekly, uh, club night we run on Tuesday, which I would just like to say that the bat cave originally started on Tuesday. I had found out recently. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's that funny. made me, that made me feel a little <laughs> bit better about our taco Tuesday setup that we have going on. <laughs> Uh, literally in the bottom of a taco shop because we're super underground like that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you can you can find us on Facebook. Uh, we we don't have a lot of channels. We kind of keep it a little bit close, more closed on that front. But uh, we're on YouTube, Goth Night, uh, Seaville, and on Facebook. So you can check us out there. Awesome, Angel. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a blast. I'm gonna have to have you on a future show. I think at some point. Absolutely. But. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, I had a blast. Well, we're going to go ahead and get into the interview that we have with the guys at the We Have a Technical Podcast. But before we do that, of course, I'd like to thank our Patreon members, those of you who have decided that the show is meaningful enough and uh, entertaining enough to uh, chuck us a dollar or more per month. Uh, so we'll start off with the founders level. We have Esmeralda and Abigail and just joining us this month, Luna as well. At the Nocturnal Council level, we have Ariel, Trey, Nephilim, Devin, Necromancy, and Anthony. And Kay coming back uh, to the Patreon page this month. And finally, at the Crow's Call level, we have Paula, Robin, Angela, Dom, Elizabeth, Marco, David, Brenda, Shelly, Rick, Angel, Elizabeth, Jen, Lyrilith, and Michelle. Thank you all so much for uh, keeping the show online because that's all you guys. If you, dear listener, would like to get some extra content and some other rewards, you can head over to patreon.com slash cemeteryconfessions 
and uh, take a look at what you can get for a dollar a month. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into the interview. We spend so much time trying to define what is goth. This is a very important question yeah. that, of course, we're going to also try and define what is not goth. Like most civilizations of the world over, we tend to be judgmental of people who don't look like us, who don't have the same beliefs. So why goths have half a dozen different words for poser yeah. instead of just one is probably a reflection of how important it is for them to define gothdom. You don't wake up one day and decide that you are goth. It's a mindset. It comes naturally. It's a lifestyle. Just so you know, goth is about three things clothing, music, and lifestyle. I don't actually have a problem with the goth stereotype of the droopy music and the lots of eyeliner and all black. It's not about being depressed and it's not about being sad or locking yourself in a dark corner and just writing sad poetry until your fingers bleed. The goth culture is finding beauty where other people wouldn't think to look. What is goth? It started out as an artistic movement about 400 years ago. Gothic art. Gothic architecture, Gothic literature. Where do you think we get the term Gothic novels from? To me, what Goth is, is a movement uh, where people who like a certain type of music dress in a certain way to express that taste in music. And that's all it is. It's just an aesthetic thing. So what makes you Goth is not to do with any kind of criteria. I don't know why people set out criteria. There's a very few things that I actually call goth. You see, that is the difference between old school goths and uh, many other people is that we are very cautious about what we call goth, actually. A lot of kids become goths because it just looks cool, you know, and that's fine too. But uh, at its core, it really is this um, this dismissing of the of the mainstream belief that we're happy all of the time and no one's ever sad, you know. All right, we are here with Alex and Bruce, the brains and dynamic duo behind I Die, You Die, and we have a technical, which are a podcast and website, respectively, uh, both of which focus on industrial goth and related genres and feature interviews with musicians and inter- innovators in the space cultural and historical discussions revolving around the music, uh, unique album reviews, and a lot of other really cool stuff that you guys should check out. Uh, IDieYouDie.com. Is that right? Yep, that's yep. right. Uh, so, yeah, thanks, guys, for coming on and uh, hanging out for a little bit. I appreciate it. Oh, Pleasure to be here, yeah. So excited to be here. Like, we're, <laughs> we're both fans of the podcast, uh, so it's very exciting to be here on Cemetery Confessions to get to chat with you for a little bit. Uh, uh, likewise. Guys, okay, so actually... <laughs> uh bruce since you're here with both myself and alex mm-hmm. uh i need to know what is it going to take f- to get you to come around on blue dangle oh i don't a, a huge endorsement contract like you know a michael jordan sized you know this is what we are paying you to walk around wearing blue dangle t-shirts and, and, and everything like that <laughs> okay. it's i mean you need to sell out in order to... Uh, yes, this would be okay. a big, big... And, and it's now just become such a point of pride, right? Like, it's mm-hmm. become such a, a sticking point uh, in the dynamic between Alex and myself. We uh, we made it the basis for this big... Uh, our One of our kind of, you know, big round number, I think it was the episode 50, we, we termed it the Great Debate uh, and made it this whole, you know, Blue Dangle is great, no, Blue Dangle fucking sucks, and we just mm-hmm. argued about it for an what hour if we and a half or whatever it what was. What if we get, like, a, a, an underground kind of wrestling match where one of you dresses up as Chris Pole and one of you dresses up as Dracula and you guys just fight it out and whoever wins is that would be pretty great. Va- yeah, vamp- vampire pro wrestling supremacy. Oh, and we could have like we could bring Vampiro in as the special guest referee and Gangrel. Oh, and oh, and Gangrel. Yeah. Oh my yeah, God! Be, yes, we could. He totally could be a manager. There's been a lo- and Kevin Thorne. There's been a lot of oh, professional Thorne, wrestlers Jesus. with vampire gimmicks over the years, which is always one of my favorite things because it's always such a, a hokey, dopey thing that points out. out you know sort of that that aspect of pro wrestling that i've always really loved but i i would like to point out and daniel back me up on this i feel that if blood angle instead of being you know sort of this germanic synth pop project if it was the same lyrics and the same aesthetics but on like a bunch of old english guys bruce would be so into it (laughs) it's entirely possible right like i mean i i fucking ride or die for nosferatu i'm fine with that yeah like yeah. yeah yeah if chris pole wasn't so pretty i like that he's so pretty though I mean, uh, he's he seems to not age ever. It does. So, I mean, 
it, it does seem to be part of the the kitsch appeal of it is this like handsome handsome man who has all sorts of like creepy slash fic being written about him oh, yeah. if you've ever dealt delved into like chris pole fanfic and like fan art it's oh oh boy <laughs> Well, at least until he puts on drip pants and makes shitty uh, electro music. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so so here's another uh, thing uh, that just before we get off the topic of Blood Angle, okay. is if you haven't gone to God listen to his audio book that you can listen to on Spotify, it's in German, so my German is non-existent. So for me, it's just listening to the sonorous tones of his voice as he reads excerpts from his oh, biography. Oh, nerd. Yeah, nerd. it is so good. Okay. And of course, occasionally he'll let out an exclamation like, UP, where I'm like, <laughs> oh man, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I actually have listened I, to it more I than once, so yeah, it's totally worth going to check out. And if it's just under Chris Pohl on Spotify, so so go do well, yourselves a favor. What did you think? Uh, what did you think about the new album? Have you listened to it yet? I did actually. I listened to it a couple times. Um, it's not my favorite. Um, yeah, that's how I felt. There's some okay songs on it, but I thought that the singles were kind of like I thought it might be one of those cases where the singles are bad, but in the context of the album, like they make more sense. Yeah. But ultimately, I just thought that his songwriting is kind of at an ebb right now, and I think that's partially just as yeah. a function of how much material that project has been producing over the last yeah. couple of years, between like the symphonic records and the re-recording of the hits and putting out new records. Like I think it might be time for him to step back for a second and take a couple of years to really like work on new material as opposed to just churning it out because i think that might the victim of 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 that process is the quality of the actual material and, but... and certainly the artistic credibility of blue angle <laughs> as a project i mean it's just a shame to see it being brought down to such a low end you gotta make hey well the sun shines or i guess in, in when, the case, when the sun shine, yeah. doesn't shine yeah <laughs> yeah it did it it did kind of sound like it was a I mean, all of his songs kind of sound the same, but mm-hmm. it sounded like he took the more mediocre songs and then rehashed them. There are a few good ones, I thought, but yeah, it was. And I kind of been waiting for that to happen, to be honest. I was surprised at how much music, how prolific he was uh, and still maintained a pretty decent songs at least in my opinion so well i mean he's put yeah. the he's put the kibosh on terminal choice i think once again i mean they they had about a, i hadn't heard that they had about a six or eight year hiatus and then they came back with i believe one or two records and then apparently he's like he canceled some live dates i think or something like that but there was a, some sort of official announcement that tc was kind of going back in the crypt for now which is a shame because that's the only one of his projects that i'm ever like i'll, I'll give a new terminal oh, choice album a listen yeah, I'm, I'm not a, i'm not a, it's I, not good by any stretch but no. i'm like this is fine for just dumb doofy industrial club shit yeah, that i can I just have on in the background while i'm gaming or whatever it's it's fine yeah yeah well all right so <laughs> we kind of jumped right into it but i i if you guys don't mind i I don't know if everyone who listens to my show also listens to your show. So uh, I'd be interested if you could give just kind of a quick background about, I guess, your origin story, as it were, kind of when you got into the scene, your DJ experiences, uh, just, you know, that kind of stuff. Sure. Get to know you a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I guess I can start. Um, I guess I would have probably been about 14 or 15, um, like a lot of other people my age who were living out in the suburbs before the internet or anything like that uh things like you know um manson and nails were sort of my first contact with any of this business but you know there were a few major bands that i got into then afterwards who really sort of you know made me realize that this was this was stuff that i was really really excited about and passionate about you know nobody uh, super out of uh the ordinary or unexpected um puppy was obviously a big one for me living just outside of vancouver mm-hmm. you had a lot of like used puppy records you know coming out of network the label and everything kind of filtering out and trickling out uh into the suburbs so i was able to get into a lot of the network bands really easily uh from there um you know, kind of your your core fundamental goth bands once I figured out that, oh, there's there's this whole thing there that kind of sounds like this, and okay, fine, I want to get all these Bauhaus and Joy Division records. And, you know, I'll admit it straight up that the uh, early um, Mick Mercer gothic rock compilations, volumes one and two, were a major, major uh, thing for me, uh, mm-hmm. and sort of seemed to point to this whole other world that I imagined uh, the big city sort of holding, right? That, oh, in, in the big city, there are, like, clubs where people, like, dress right. all fancy and in black and one of these days i'm gonna move there and i can yeah. go to those and everything like that and then so those first couple of years of being able to go to the city and actually check out the club scene and everything like that were just absolute catnip for me uh and within a couple of years after that i just started uh djing initially at the kind of the smaller shows or smaller nights that i was sort of running myself 
uh, and then eventually kind of got brought into the big major kind of goth industrial night sanctuary uh, in Vancouver. And along the way, uh, I met Alex, who had been uh, recently moved over from Halifax. Yeah, my my origins are, are pretty prosaic as well. Um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, here in Canada, is not exactly like a a uh, you know sort of a place where there's a lot of stuff pertinent to uh, sort of goth or industrial going on. But I think I latched on to it earliest through ministry. Um, there was that brief period where uh, sort of the 120 minutes or in Canada, sort of the much music, you know, wedge or the Pepsi power hour really latched on to industrial metal and specifically ministry. And I think that was sort of my entry point. So it was sort of a quick step from ministry to Nine Inch Nails, Nine Inch Nails to Skinny Puppy, Skinny Puppy to, oh my God, there's a whole world of this stuff. And within a couple of years, I was doing college radio shows where I was playing music that I uh, had learned about online, uh, largely through Rec Music Industrial, actually, uh, if you remember that particular news group. Um, and occasionally from alt gothic as well. Um, so I like to say that the the first goth night I ever went to, I was DJing at, which is true. Um, <laughs> it was a night called Shadow Play that uh, I worked at for a number of years in Halifax with a couple of friends. And it is one of those things that I, I always like to think of as being sort of one of the hallmarks of that era. That when you actually threw a party, like there was enough people starved for something like that to do in whatever area you were in that you know, a hundred people would show up or 200 mm. people would show up, which is hilarious because now like you throw a goth night in a city, you'd be lucky if 75 or a hundred people show up. If it's not like a Saturday night, you know, you know, in a convenient location or what have mm. you people, I think have been re become really spoiled for choice on club events and stuff like that. This is another topic. I digress one way or the other. Eventually I ended up moving to Vancouver because skinny puppy reasons. And uh, Bruce and I <laughs> became pals and started DJing together at various events. And uh, eventually after several misfires, where we started up websites that um, didn't make it very long. Uh, don't go looking for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the writing is terrible in comparison. Yeah, and the focus was not there. Eventually, um, Bruce was finishing up his uh, degree, and uh, we had said that once he didn't have any more academic obligations that we would have a run at starting up a new website, and so we kind of... Uh, we threw a little bit of money at the web design, which I think was our impetus to actually try and get something out of it. Like, I think if we'd used a free platform, we wouldn't necessarily have been as motivated to do anything with IDIUDI, but because we invested a bit of cash and a bit of effort to get it started, there was a lot of impetus for us to keep doing it, and that's kind of how it took off. The, so, the other credit that has to be given has to be to Dan Gatto and the uh, Continues project. We were watching Continues uh, play at Kinetic uh, in Toronto, I guess. It was Kinetic had moved to Toronto by then. no. And, was it still Montreal? never happened in Toronto. That was supposed to happen in the Festival of God Cancer. Or sorry, I'm, I'm getting it all mixed up with Aftermath. And point being, we were watching Continues play, and I was like, man, this is great. This is so good. I love Dan Gatto. I love Babyland. I love this new project that he's working on. We should interview him, but we don't have a blog or a project anymore. Okay, that's our... We, we went up and talked to him. We're like, hey, we'd like to interview you in a few months. It's like, okay, well, we have an interview lined up. We at least have to now have a website, have it look good, have it be organized, and you know, have a regular po publishing and posting schedule. Let's actually treat it seriously this time and that was yeah a little over five years or oh, come, god it's coming Almost up on six years. coming up on six years ago now yeah, yeah. well so let me ask you this because you mentioned part of it was uh having uh, having to throw money into the project kind of helped keep you around uh f so like for me because i my first project was uh the requiem podcast which is nine years old now and that was mm -hmm. something that i was just i was paying for i never i got a couple donations here and there and um but f for most and even now, actually, that's a separate thing. I still pay out of pocket for that. And I know you guys just started your Patreon page. But being that uh, you did start this project out of out of your own pocket. And I know having a website and doing a podcast takes a ton of time. What is it that, you know, all these years later from when you first got into the scene still kind of keeps you uh, passionate and and wanting to be involved in it? Uh, what's the, I, I know you guys are, I, I would consider you intellectuals. So like, what's, what's the, the deeper meaning for you personally that keeps you interested and, and passionate about doing what you're doing, even when you're not, you know, it's not a career or something like that. Um, uh, well, a big part of it is that when we originally started, uh, the website, it was to just try and capture some of the stuff that was already going on. Like Bruce and I would have these long, long conversations, you know, either on, on social media or in person or between sets while we're DJing or whatever about 
whatever, like the new record by whatever band we're interested in at this time or some hot new discovery or have you listened to the new Ashbury Heights? What do you think of that? You know what I think is interesting about that? And so it was us thinking, you know, uh, the, maybe a bit egotistically, we should capture some of this. Mm -hmm. um, there's such a dearth of writing about the stuff that we're interested in, be it goth, industrial, synth pop, yeah. EDM, whatever. And, you know, uh, we figured it, it could be worse than to just try and get more stuff out there so that when somebody Googles whatever band, Ashbury Heights, you know, uh, blood angle whatever then there's going to be something else there for them to find and yeah. and you know sort of you know amplify the signal a little bit so a big part of it was the the fact that uh, you know the the passion has always been there on a personal level and i think if if either of us sort of drifted away or stopped being interested in this music in any way it wouldn't last much longer after that yeah. like it's always just sort of a function of our our friendship for all intents and purposes but also i think um the uh the metaphor that we like to use it's like having a gym buddy like if if mm. you're going to go to the gym and you have somebody to go with you're way more likely not to skip a day and so we settled into a rhythm of doing it very early that I think has been very easy for us to maintain because neither of us wants to let the other person down or get shit for letting the other mm. person down <laughs> to the point where we've both like done a lot of uh, prob things that were probably not good for our day jobs or our personal lives. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hang out tonight, baby. I've totally got to yeah. write about this new Wumps Cut <laughs> reissue, which yeah, is yeah, terrible. That's how I'm <laughs> yeah. spending my evening. Yeah. I guess yeah. if, I, if I can speak on that a little bit more uh, kind of abstractly or, or whimsically, I've been really... And I think this is this maybe bodes well for our continued in, involvement and um, writing about it. It's been really interesting to me to see how things change in mm. goth and industrial music. Right? It's been very, it's very, very different. And you know, you don't need me to get, to give you a little brief history of, of subgenres and microgenres and everything like that. But I mean, stuff. This stuff changes relatively quickly. I mean, we have, and then even when we have kind of neo-traditionalist schools of, oh, I, we, you know, we're a label that just puts out second wave goth rock. That's the good mm -hmm. shit. And that's all we're going to put out. Hey, you know what? EBM peaked when, you know, with uh, that total agent, we're just going to have bands that recreate that. Like even having that as a neo-traditional or neoclassical vein, that's interesting to me from a historical uh, sort of almost academic perspective. And I guess I like seeing how the topos of this business changes and how younger people who are coming up in it now have such a different experience of it than I did. And mm. I'm not, I, I hope I'm not, you know, somebody who places a premium on their own nostalgia or anything like that and decrees that, well, no, that was the real shit. That was, you know, that was, the, that was when stuff was real. That was, that was when it was good was when I was, you know, 18 to 22. Right. And the fact that, other people are going to be informed by things in such a different way really, really excites me and, and, and you know, is interesting to me. Uh, we have a younger friend uh, for whom, like, AFI, when they were doing their, like, whole gothy punk, mall punk sort of thing, that was her gateway into it, right? By yeah, the time that also. AFI were doing that, I was like, oh, pff, God, fuck, forget this. This is, yeah. you know, da, 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 da. But that was obviously something about that band triggered something for her and that's what you know sent her down the whole rabbit hole and you know has kept her uh I involved in it all these years later i mean I, she doesn't really listen to afi anymore and you know i don't listen to manson as much as i you know did when i was 14 or anything but that's that's cool to me right that there is still there are so many different ways into it and what it is right now is continuing to change and i want to see how it changes and i want to see what's next so and document that too yeah right? exactly like, yeah. you know and it, of course it's it's not an unbiased documentation of that stuff but sort of like you do with cemetery confessions and you know not not to put you over too much on your own podcast mm -hmm. but one of the things that i love about your show is when i put it on there's always going to be some discussion of an article of some kind and you bring in different perspectives yeah. and it creates conversation so it's never just like you know reporting on this thing or right. you know replicating what this th the argument that this thing is made you're looking at it critically and to me that's so important it's, is... it's long form journalism essentially yeah, right exactly. need, every every everything the world politics you know everybody needs more long form journalism yeah and yeah. so it's sort of one of the things that I love about what you do and it's sort of one of the things that we strive to do as well is you know it's not enough to record the fact that a thing happened because that information is more and more easy to come by as time goes by <clears> this like, album can... gets a 4 out of 5 this yes, album exactly. gets a 6 out of 10 but right. what what incisive things are being said about that thing? What's what's the common understanding? What was the perspective on it at that time? So, yeah, that's yeah. that's a big thing for us. Yeah, and I was just talking to my wife about that last night, actually, because I was saying even if, I mean, we're, I was talking with her about why I'm passionate about doing what I'm doing, but I was like, even if nobody cares, I think there's still implicit value in the information, like you were saying, like, like so 
like when I interviewed Fred Berger, uh, like there's no audio interviews with him mm-hmm. like that, or just the the interview I just did with William Faith and and Sarah Rose. Um, nice. Like I think I think the discussions, the long form discussions around that, don't really exist. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe in some books you can find interviews here and there, but not not in a free way that you can just easily get online. So I think just having that as a as a historical document or even just something academics can look at or just something that like you were saying um you know part of the reason i started cemetery confessions was because i wanted there to be something like that and there wasn't and i was tired of waiting and so i know what it's like to feel like there needs to be this thing and then you find it and you're like yes this is what i this is what i wanted Mm -hmm. and so i i I'm glad that stuff like that is getting out there. But it, it's, it's one of the weirdest experiences when you're doing research for a band or something like that. And then you end up Googling, oh, yeah, what were their last three albums like or something? And it's like, oh, crap, the, the majority of this is stuff that I wrote like four years ago. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, All right. So let's talk about this then, because this came up uh, in the interview that I did with Sarah and William. Um, And it's this idea that looking at the music that's going on in the goth and industrial scene right now, that uh, it's to a larger extent, uh, the bands that are labeling themselves as such are producing either something that's rehashed or something Mm. that's no longer innovative. And their contention was that the the music that is really, and I think you guys have brought this up before as well, uh, but the music that's really uh, being innovative and, and doing something new is coming from bands outside of the culture and but could still be called like dark music Mm -hmm. so before you know before i get into that anymore what's your kind of general opinions about that is that you know do you think bands that call themselves goth are just kind of rehashing stuff that's already been done and there's not really much value or much to chew on there i mean that's something i kind of realized or uh, that was a trend i began to notice uh, when i was kind of in my early 20s about how obviously categorically uncool it was to label yourself as Mm. being goth but how when other people call you goth that's you know that's that's when you're doing okay and then because then you get to push back and say no i'm not (laughs) uh you know and also the the corollary of that of course is that oh it's always been cool if you're a halfway successful underground artist or anything like that it's always been cool it's always cool to have been a goth oh yeah i was a goth when i was a teenager oh yeah i was i was into all that stuff when i was like 18 or whatever but i mean whatever i'm I'm a grown-ass adult now yeah um i mean on the one i i don't want to you know bury or slam you know any of the uh the acts that we love who are really cleaving to like no i like really really dig crazy tripped out psyched out you know electro industrial uh from the late 80s and early 90s Mm -hmm. that's my shit and that's what i want to you know kind of dig into and, Mm -hmm. and whatnot i love all of that stuff i love bands who are just sort of returning to and as you sort of say rehashing the second wave goth rock formula because i fucking love it yeah pretentious was like one of the best records of like the last 10 years in my estimation is it is it over 10 years old now it's It's not no no it came out in 2010 it's a 2010 record all right yeah Yeah. oh wow really it was 2010 yeah like that's one of the best records the last 10 years like any genre like that i'm interested in by far from a from every perspective like and yeah it is 100 percent just a a this is what we're doing. It's second wave goth rock. Here you go. <laughs> right, yep. And like, it's awesome. Yep, yep, Can't yeah. take anything away from it. But I mean, but on the other hand, you have acts like, um, like uh, t- to take an example for that we sort of really like to dig into a band like Legend, right? Who had essentially no real, not much profile uh, in North America or even outside of, um, are these Swedish or from Norway? Uh, I think they're Norwegian. I can't remember. I, I, I feel no terrible idea. forgetting this now. Um, but when they played at Terminus, for instance, uh, in, in Calgary, that's sort of, you know, that and their album coming out on Artifact, a, you know, a label that on the one hand does all sorts of deep genre stuff, but also tries to bring in stuff from outside and sort of say, look at how relevant this is. Mm. Um, you could tell that that was a real sort of shock to people in the crowd at Terminus, like, holy shit, how is this band that we know nothing about that doesn't get played in our clubs that isn't on our playlists or anything like that how are they so together so professional their songs are fucking amazing Mm. their relevance to the sort of uh, aesthetic and sound and styles that we are interesting to is immediately apparent to us yeah how have we been missing out on that and i think that that's something that's really been changing for the better and i think that that has i think we've talked about this on on facebook a couple of times daniel just the idea that 
younger people don't necessarily go for a, you know, kind of sign a, sign all in on like, oh, I'm a punk, I'm a goth, I'm a whatever, right? The much more kind of buffet or smorgasbord type, oh, I'm just going to grab a little bit of whatever I like. Uh, and, and kind of, I, I don't necessarily have to throw my whole identity in with that. And I think you're starting to see that trickling into kind of the actual scene itself, that there's an acknowledgement that a band doesn't have to be capital G goth or capital Y industrial or, you know, true rivet head or, you know, uh, true EBM, as we might say, uh, in order to be respected and accepted. I, I still really want to get one of those death to false EBM shirts. We might. I, uh, I don't know if we have any lying around. I'll take we, a look. We don't, I don't think, but uh, that, that might come back again. It's been such a thing that we keep coming back to it. So it might, there might be another <laughs> run of those at some point in the future. Uh, to, I want to get a, like a butt flap patch of it. <laughs> that would be amazing yeah. um sorry go ahead uh just also as, a, as an interesting corollary i think to what you were talking about is uh the idea that um the boundaries of what has always been relevant to goth as a subculture and industrial as a subculture i mean and those things in aggregate have always been um sort of inclusive of things that aren't technically those things mm -hmm. like i mean depeche mode is probably one of the most important bands to both genres and in are no way depeche mode an industrial band or a goth right. band for that matter right. you know yeah. uh you, know, you can make similar arguments for the cure you know joy yeah. division whatever whatever your other you know sort of uh mount rushmore type bands are um it, it's kind of interesting to look at from the perspective of it's always been a subculture wherein you know the 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 most influential or some of the most influential things are things that are not actually yes you know, of that thing. And right. that's kind of an interesting way to sort of consider the subculture as a whole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I view it as, as like a revivalist movement, kind of a pastiche, like an amalgam of, of stuff. But, uh, you know, now there's this kind of discussion around uh, where do we, I, well, really, to be honest, it's, this has been happening since the nineties, but the discussion around uh, how do we keep true to what the culture is and how do we uh, expand and move forward? So, but but when we're talking about these bands that are outside of the culture uh, that could ostensibly be sonically within uh, goth or industrial culture, how do we kind of, if if you could shape the way that we move forward, how do we kind of rectify that? Do we claim those bands as being part of the scene? Do we expand the boundaries of what it means to mm -hmm. sonically be included in it? Um, and then if we do that, is it is it making the the culture less meaningful or is it more akin to like say the the post-punk movement in the 80s that's a tough question um that's it, why i asked you <laughs> yeah i mean it used to be that we had a club culture that made this stuff yeah. real easy <clears throat> because if a song sounds good and you can dance to it and it has enough sonic elements that make it mm. fit in with sort of the more traditional music that you're playing, then you could just start playing a song by like Odonis Odonis or, or you know, some other band like that in the industrial club or the goth club. And then people would just go, yep, it's part of our thing now. You know, case closed. All right, moving on to the next thing. Right. Um you know, I maintain that if you play uh, Stone Fist by the band Health from Los Angeles in any industrial club in the world, that would get over with that crowd. People would be into it. But I mean, there, that that culture has been withering on the vine for such an extended period of time that I think that it has really started to move towards being this like goth nights or 80s nights now is, is kind of one of the sad parts of it. Yep. And it's very hard to find events outside of, I think, the death rock scene where they do try and include new music. If, if you're talking about strictly goth events, same with industrial events, they're throwback nights where there is not an emphasis on, emphasis on new music. Of course, that doesn't apply to all events that label themselves as goth or industrial events. But I, I think that support system of a club culture where you can help you know, sort of be inclusive of music from outside the boundaries is is kind of gone. Um, mm. I'll yeah. be honest with you. It's a thing we've struggled with a lot. Like, I remember when Light Asylum came out a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, yeah. that, that stuff was incredible, and we loved yeah. it so much. Yeah. And we had to have this weird thought of just like, all right, well, they're getting written about on The Quietus and on Pitchfork and on yeah. Pop Matters and, you know, yeah. Brooklyn Vegan and all these other websites. So we don't <laughs> want to dedicate any of our time to putting them over. Well, at the same time saying, like, that they're so relevant to yeah. what we do. How do we reconcile those things? And we yeah. never really came up with a good answer. The yeah. um, Just uh, as a little kind of counterpoint to that, uh, Daniel, you were mentioning the idea of like, oh, like thinking of it like post-punk. And that's sort of, uh, we totally flip-flop on this and it's totally arbitrary. But like, 
half of the time when we're talking about a band that is working with st- in in a style that comes from anything from about 1983 forward, we will often just end up using the term post-industrial, right? You know, to kind of demarcate the idea that, oh, okay, you know, your uh, your original, your your cabs, your TG, uh, you know, your non and your uh, everybody's... Seb for some reason. Yeah, and Monte Cazaza for God knows what reason. No, this, this is the true original industrial and everything that comes afterwards once, you know, you have people start integrating drum machines and things like that into it. Well, now it's post-industrial. And I'm fine with that as, as a term, but if you know, in that case, it's been happening since you know the early '80s, right? By yeah. the time you get to, by the time Wax Tracks coalesces with an identity, it's the music is so far removed and so different from the original, just you know, pure sonic terrorism that you know Throbbing Gristle originally was, right? And again, sort of as I was saying, you know somebody like Alex or somebody like myself is going to use ministry as the, you know, the thing that gets them into that business. Right. So the question of whether there is a original genome uh, that needs to be preserved. I mean, you know, I, I think you either have to look at it either wholly like historically and say like for, you know, two to three years in this part of the world, in these cities, this sound was happening and it was this thing. And we can call it that. Or we have to view it, uh, view, excuse me, as a much more fluid continuum that is continuing yeah. to warp and evolve and everything like that. And I mean, and I was there when you know future pop started being played in the clubs, right? And there was this real split down the middle, mm-hmm. of just like fuck this. I did not yeah. come out to the industrial club to listen to fucking trance music. I'm the, <laughs> I'm getting the fuck out of here. Screw all y'all. And you know, it was a real thing. Um, Fifteen years later, we can sort of we can pick and choose about what elements of future pop we did and didn't like and everything. But, you know, those bands, you know, now in a kind of a retro sort of way are still being included in, in festivals and compilations and whatnot. And you're even getting, you know, throwback future pop, like, Hey, I'm going to return to, you know, I'm going to try to recreate, you know, the summer of 2000 or whatever it was. It's yeah. important to note that the, probably the biggest headlining touring acts in industrial um, at this point are the bands that were popular in 2000. Yes. So VNV, Covenant, um, Suicide Commando. Mm. Uh, there's probably two or three others that I can't think of off the top of my <laughs> head. And that's worrisome to me yes. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Not to diverge too much off on that topic, but there's been a severe lack of any kind of like headline power yep. industrial act or goth act that has emerged over the last bunch of years. The last one that had any kind of ubiquity was Combi Christ and... That's mm. a whole other kettle of fish uh, that I have no desire to yeah, open up yeah. right now. We, we should specify that, that, that we're talking about North America here. Yeah, we do yeah. not nearly have as much of a handle on what happens. We we kind of, we view the whole like European festival scene with this mixture of like, oh my God, I can't believe they're so lucky to be able to have. Like you Black know, is playing? Black, Holy you know, shit. Yeah. You know, that or like, oh yeah. my God, Cast Product is doing a bunch of shows over there. Shit, that would be amazing. Yeah. So on the one hand, there's this real jealousy and envy of what's happening in Europe. And then some of the like over the top, like kind of, you know, bordering on folk metal goth acts that get booked on those festivals i'm like oh jesus no this is not my thing at all yeah, yeah. i could or not corn. tell you uh, or corn in the case of <laughs> yeah, oh God, this year. yeah yeah have you ever gone through one of those lineups and just tried to figure out like the the sort of the relationship of some of the bands to our thing i guess this kind of relates to your question in terms of like uh, inclusiveness of things that don't seem like they're part of our thing but are part of our thing yeah i always view that as the uh, promoters trying to draw a wider audience and make yep. money to be honest but mm-hmm. I don't know. It's. I think. <clears throat> I think there is something to be said for his, taking a historical look at it. That there has always been some degree of ambiguity, and uh, we like to kind of look back and and pick things apart more to um, play into what our biases are for what we think things should be. But I think that ambiguity has always been there, and it's a. It's it's this. It's this tension between uh, wanting to have a delineation where something is implicitly meaningful but also not being too vague but i think living in that space of that ambiguous space which really is is really difficult because like neurobiologically we are we hate that but um it's just it's just part of this thing that kind of does breed uh flexibility and fluidity and 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 making stuff interesting again instead of Mm-hmm. being so rigid that it just breaks and falls apart kind of like the punk scene i guess but, mm. yeah. um so i this kind of leans into i think uh, the the term that you two like to use which is our thing uh and bef- before i kind of really ask 
a few questions about that. Can you kind of unpack like what's the dis- what what the choice was behind doing that? Was it are are you trying to make like a an umbrella subculture which the other subcultures are under, but is still a subculture to the larger culture, like a, like alternative or something like that? Or um, it it kind of started as a joke, um, honestly. <laughs> okay. And what it was was that um. There's this this sort of hokey old uh, myth about, or I guess it's not a myth. I think it might actually be based in fact. But um, the mafia refers to the themselves as La Casa Nostra, this thing of okay. ours. The idea being that you that they would never refer to themselves as an organized crime family or as <laughs> mobsters or the mafia. It's just it's it's, it's this us. thing that we do. It's our right. thing. And so for a while, Bruce and I would refer to the broad idea of the industrial and gothic subculture and aggregate as just, you know, La Gotha Nostra, you know, this goth thing of ours. I, I um, wanted to do t-shirts with the, like the, the godfather puppet strings thing with that. And we, we never got them done. <laughs> and eventually it just came down to our thing. And I think at the very first post on I die, you die I actually kind of tried to address the yeah. idea of like, look saying that it's the goth scene does not capture it because there's so much of what goes on in these clubs that is not, traditionally thought of as goth and saying it's the goth industrial thing by that point you've already gotten so broad that it's starting to lose shape and so i guess part of it was just a desire to not have to address the question of what is or isn't included Hmm. um it's just a case of us being able to say yeah it's just part of the broader world of our thing and i think it also came as a result of each of us having spent at least 10 years getting into futile circular arguments often on the internet about Mm. what real industrial was, what was goth and what wasn't. And it just, nothing ever came out of those discussions, at least insofar as they were mediated by kind of, you know, millennial net culture. Uh, and, And so we just wanted to kind of almost like put that on a sidebar and sort of have this, the idea of it being, I mean, we're, it's a little bit of almost like metaphysical sleight of hand, right? It's sort of the, you know, like, oh, uh, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it sort of thing, right? right? You know, right. I can't give you a convenient definition for this, but I know it when I hear it. And I know, yeah, this would, oh, fuck, I can't wait to DJ this. Or, man, this would go in really well, uh, you know, on a mixtape along with these other bands and everything. And that's, you know, that's 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 a, that's a spirit or an idea that doesn't always come down to really rigid, um, musicological, uh, you know, definitions. Although I'm sure someone like our pal Alex Reed, who has studied this stuff extensively and is also, you know, a, a, a published academic, a published academic who knows everything there is to know about, you know, the, yeah. the formal structures of this music, he would be able to draw those connections. Right. Um, and it sort of just kind of became this. Well, look, like if if we know it when we hear it, if we think it would sound good in a in a night that we are DJing or in a party we wanted to throw or anything like that, if it makes us think about, on the one hand, earlier music and oh yeah, man, like this this sort of reminds me of old early whoever, but I can see that they're doing something new with it as well. If it sort of sparked that interest on it, well, then it's in the club, and then it's it's mm-hmm. what we're going to write about. It's what we're going to talk about. So have have you ever? Uh, toyed with i mean it seems uh, at least to me that you guys are a bit more averse to uh from a personal perspective calling yourself a goth or a rivet head or whatever is that are you kind of on the side of uh you know (laughs) these people who are ostensibly goths but don't want the label or um do you kind of claim any of those subcultural markers or you just say "Well, we're we're into it i don't want to label it I'm I'm totally fine with it. Uh, in my case, I think it's I've almost developed I've doubled down on it as a reactionary thing as I have grown like older and more milk toast in my appearance and everything like that. <laughs> um, like I like I think for a while there I was the joke that I was making was like oh yeah my 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 style or my look is gothic sabermetrician right <laughs> like you know I wear a lot of baseball shit but I it's all black or whatever. <laughs> uh, I also seem to recall we went through the period of just, like, our credibility is such that it doesn't even matter if I'm wearing, like, a day-glow clown outfit. Uh, I am yep. still so real and so true that I can wear whatever I want. Yep. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is very joking. I don't actually believe that at all. Like, I, I don't <laughs> believe in authenticity. I don't believe in being a, quote, bigger fan or more true or more real. Although mm. I do love the term rivet head, and I do occasionally yep. bust Hell it yeah. out on occasion. I get it. That's a nice part of... I once again our thing that I, I I like associating myself with because it speaks to the kind of people who've had the same experiences that we've had, and I like having that sort of that little I guess secret handshake kind of thing yeah. with those people. And there's never been I mean in terms of identity or whatever, like maybe this is just a function of of growing up when we did and having a different high school experience or having a different uh, experience when first going to clubs or whatever. But there's never been any other. Um, 
identity or zone or sphere or, you know, Borduvian world or anything like that, or field, excuse me, um, that ever felt like home the way this right. stuff did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's all th- sorts of things I, you know, can complain about or I can feel like, ah, shit, this, this club night's on its last legs or whatever it is. And, you know, if I don't go out to a club for a while or if I, you know, haven't, uh, you know, like I now have very, you know, short, boring, you know, non-dyed hair or anything like that. Um, it's still going to be the only thing that has ever actually felt like a uh, space outside of, you know, just, oh, family or school or whatever it is that's ever really felt like a thing that I could really get involved with and get behind. There are yeah. other aspects of my life, you know, things like, oh, my 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 academic work, my, mm-hmm. you know, being a baseball fan, being a pro wrestling fan, whatever it is. But those things are never going to be like, shit, this is it. This is my stuff. This is my jam. This is, you know, what I'm going to, whether I look like it or not, this is kind of where my heart will lie until I die. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and whatever. It's been, you know, 20, 20 plus years at this point, you know, and as that great meme that was going around uh, a few years ago says, you know, it's not a phase mom. I'm an adult goth. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I, I feel that a lot. Have you seen that, that uh, there's a cartoon of that where uh, the mom's berating the, like the goth teen for, for being a phase. And then uh, the next panel is she's like 90 with a walker, still dressed the same. She's like, suck it, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, the, you know, I mean, God, I feel like it happens every year that um, for some reason it's the Guardian that's always publishing this. These like, oh, like, you know, grown up goths who are now like yeah. raising their own yeah. kids and let's do a lifestyle <laughs> article on that, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And, you know, those things have been happening for, for umpteen years. You go to things like Whitby, you go to things like Nocturnal Culture, and it's like, oh, we've got like three generations of families all going yeah. to this and everything like that. And, you know, yourself as somebody who's, you know, done a lot more you know, sociological academic work, yeah. uh, than either of us. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've seen in that and steeped into that a lot, a lot. And I'm totally fine with that. Like that, that, I mean, on the one hand, yeah, like I can understand the, oh, well, why would you limit yourself by doing this or that or calling yourself X and Y and, and not that. But I think as long as you're not getting into the sorts of often overblown ideas of, of purity or trueness or realness that I think authenticity that I would say, I think are much more, as I understand it, much more pervasive problems in like punk and metal circles than they are in uh goth mm-hmm. and industrial. Those scenes are, I would say maybe a lot more healthy and thriving than ours. Mm-hmm. But one of the, the trade-offs there is you don't have this real, I mean, obviously we, we have all these stereotypes about goths being like snobby and cliquish and elitist and, and everything like that. But I think, Really, when it comes down to it, we when we talk about oh, you know, tr- you know, more gother than thou, and all of those, you know, the the goth tests of the nineteen nineties and everything, that's all being done with a smirk. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I don't uh, I don't want to get into the authenticity thing too much because it's. I mean, there has been a lot of well, uh, some academic work done on that, and I have a few thoughts. But yeah, maybe we can come back to that if we have time at the end. But that's mm-hmm. that's like sure. a big. A big thing. Oh, it's a yeah, but it's since, a big big bugbear. Since since I had you guys here, um, as uh, fellow you know media producers, content producers, and in, in this uh, micro media kind of sphere, I wanted to uh, talk a, a little bit around that and and mm-hmm. what your thoughts are on that. So I guess we can just kind of start with. Um, I guess you mentioned that you had start tried starting websites previously, but have you experimented with other? Uh, other forms of media like YouTube channels or, you know, magazines or something like that. And what is it that, that uh, drove you to doing a website or a podcast as opposed to something else? I think uh, initially the, the blog format sort of enabled us to be um, less journalistic in a way that I thought was really appealing. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we sort of addressed this in our 150th podcast the other week is like, we're in such a small sphere um, that you end up meeting like, most of the artists you're interested in in some capacity and then you sort of end up having these very friendly cordial relationships with them that are not um i mean this is not a humble brag but like most of the artists that i've been supremely interested in over the course of the last five years i've ended up meeting in some capacity or yeah. talking to for an extended period of time hanging out with them and so there's the part of that that I, I i think with a blog rather than sort of presenting ourselves as serious journalists we can kind of get away with blurring the lines mm. between journalism and fan. Like, I, I think I'd rather be a fan than a serious journalist at this point in my life because I think fans get to have more fun with this stuff. Well, yeah. the, the one thing that we've also, I mean, on the one hand, we're, you know, doing things like the Patreon or whatever that are trying to sort of, you know, make sure we're at least, you know, financially neutral or breaking even uh, on this. But it's, 
something that you and I talked about a good deal about with with DJing and things uh, back when you know DJing was a more slightly more lucrative mm -hmm. uh, field than it is today is that I never wanted this stuff to become a day job because when it does you start becoming beholden to all sorts of financial concerns and pressures that I don't want to bring into this thing that I love so much and that gets me up uh, in the morning the way a day job just never will. I know that both Alex and I have had varying degrees of experience in you know, things like, you know, writing articles and, and interviews and whatnot for, uh, you know, weekly newspapers or this or that and actually, you know, getting paid uh, for those things. And that's great. And that's fun and everything. Um, but when it came time to actually doing our own thing, um, the, the, like Alex sort of said, we're kind of able to have our cake and eat it too. We can get as serious as we want, when we want to do a whole like, okay, we are going to go through item by item by item, the entire How Job discography and talk about the pros and cons of each and why uh, this has happened or writing, you know, extended think pieces about, oh, the um, the idea of, uh, as, as people were paranoid a few years ago about, oh, um, people from outside the industrial world are taking over and, you know, bands like Youth Code and High Functional Flesh aren't real rivet heads, which is totally where the Death to Fall CBM thing came from. Um, <laughs> We can have those discussions on the one hand, but we can also just, yeah, like, you know, go to a festival and have a few beers with, you know, bands that have come to become our friends or whatever and not feel as though we're trading anything off. There are a couple right. of lines that we have had where, like, somebody has offered us sort of a, oh, would you care to review this incredibly lavish, very expensive box set? We can send you some promo copies of it or whatever it is. And we've kind of had to go... No, that kind of is almost getting into a yeah. the potential if for If you're sending me payola. something with a price tag that has $150 on it, I can't accept it. Yeah. Send me the yeah. digital files, and then at least I can be objective and yeah. honest in, in my assessment of that because there was no exchange of whatever. Yeah. And Which is rough because sometimes somebody will offer to send you something you really want, <laughs> and then you end up paying for it like a jerk. Um. Yeah. No, I had Actually, I had an instance of that just recently where a friend of mine he, who was a friend first uh, wanted – he was said – or he asked me if I was interested in buying a, a pair of old shoes that he had because they were my size. And I said, yes. And then he said, well, hey, actually, I can just send you those uh, if you want to write a review of my uh, album. And yeah. I had I, I had to have a conversation with him about like, uh, I was like, I, I'm okay with it, but I want you to understand that I'm going to objectively review this. And if I don't like it, I'm going to tell you that I don't like it. So yeah. we had to have a discussion about that first, but... In a more general sense, uh, when it comes to the uh, subcultural media and micro media, however you want to call it, um, it seems like it's, I guess there's a couple questions around this, but uh, first of all, it seems more of a DIY thing where you have people getting into it that don't have formal training, either aren't journalists or weren't, weren't even like on the music side, maybe not formally trained in music, uh, creating this stuff. Is it? Uh, do you think that kind of lends to uh, more interesting product? And then also, do you think with mediums like podcasting, um, I know you guys had mentioned that your your downloads were going up. Do you think that uh, that type of thing is something that is the future of this medium or is it something that's uh, going to hit a dead end? Um, you know, we had we had uh, zines and magazines back in the day, mm. and that was really how the diffusion of information got out there, which was important to uh, ke keeping a meaningful culture. Do you think that there's going to be a next thing, or have we moved online, and that's just kind of where it's going to stay? Or, I guess I mean it's it, it's tough to say. Uh, I I don't want to speculate about the permanence of of, of podcasting specifically. Mm. Um, I mean I still. You know, the distinction between uh, a, an audio interview with someone that we are doing in 2017 versus a transcript of an interview that is in an oldest issue of Industrial Nation um, that, you know, that, that we can go to and, and look up. I don't know that there's a, a tremendous uh, distinction to be had there. I have one. Okay, go. Okay. Um both obviously have an editorial voice, right? You, like, you don't know what was included or excluded in the transcription. Same with, yep. you know, audio editing. I mean, we've had interviews that have been way longer that we've had to cut down for time or, or whatever else, or content, or occasionally somebody said something that they asked us to remove, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the key difference um, is uh, the uh, means of consumption. Mm -hmm. um, I think that podcasting 
And the reason that podcasting may be taking off more is that folks who want to be involved but have a hard time finding the time to read extended you know, yeah. think pieces and stuff like that can listen to a podcast on the bus. Like I marathon through most episodes of Cemetery Confessions that were available th- while I was playing Dark Souls. Like that is mm. literally how I got, you know, completely conversant in, in what this podcast that we're on right now does. And if I had not, you know, I, there's no way I could have read, you know, transcripts of all those conversations right, while right. I was playing video yeah. games or yeah. while I was on the bus or, you know, while I was working out or anything else like that. He said as if he worked out regularly. <laughs> um <laughs> So, I mean, I think that that is a major part of, of what makes podcasting very appealing. I think that more and more we talk about the bandwidth problem, right? Like the mm. issue now is that um, everybody has access to everything all the time, which is great. You know, the kind of music that you would have never been able to find at any point previous in, in your life is now at everybody's fingertips. It's just a matter of, you know, finding the time to consume it and also having yeah. a filter to filter out everything else so you can consume it. So yeah. it's kind of nice to have this sort of easy to digest while you're doing the dish other stuff kind of format and i think that that maybe doubles back to your uh first question there daniel about the um the idea of you know being an, an amateur versus a professional on those things that this sort of a medium really does allow for on the one hand a broad enough ecosystem that the 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 initial uh investment or the initial uh, startup cost of, of time or money or whatever it is, is is low enough that yeah anybody can get involved with it but it is also and i would hate to you know advocate for social darwinism in any form here <laughs> but that the good stuff you will sort of void rice <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that the, the good stuff will eventually sort of endure and hold out, uh, and people who, um, you know, aren't, aren't as committed to it or just don't have, uh, a, a take on it that's interesting or mm-hmm. in-depth enough to be rewarding to people, that those things just kind of do get filtered out, uh, eventually, right? I mean, everybody, uh, so many of the podcasts that I listen to, uh, whether they are music-related, sports-related, general culture-related, or, or whatever it is, so many of them are people who kind of got into this world at sort of an amateur level in whatever field they are in, and then bit by bit were able able to sort of build up credibility on their own through their own projects mm-hmm. to the point that whether they are operating within the professional chains and professional spheres of those uh, worlds, they ha- they carry with them a degree of credibility and respect that you know, they can get interviews with, you know, interesting uh, and, and credible people within them that when they say something, you know, people listen, right? And that's something that's built up over time. I think whether you are coming at it from a professional or, or an amateur, and if you are coming at it w- as somebody who has professional training uh, or, or job experience or academic training in any of these things, then that's kind of a cool, interesting thing. Like, oh man, this guy has a, you know, a, a degree in, you know, music, m- musicology or something, or, mm-hmm. oh man, this woman wrote an entire book about, you know, goth culture or something. I, I'm interested to hear what she has to say about these things. Right. And that can be part of the hook or the appeal as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I do love the idea that because we're in sort of this this um this microculture, as you put it, that the experts are basically anybody who puts in the work. Like yeah. there is yeah. no formal yeah. department of Goth and Industrial Studies <laughs> at any university <laughs> where you have to have a degree and then be a tenured professor at in order to be the person who gets interviewed about those things on BBC. Like Although uh, Drew if there was Drew Daniel, I'd like to say would be the dean. Yeah, yeah I would love <laughs> if Drew Daniel from Matmos uh, who also wrote an amazing book about Throbbing Gristles, uh twenty jazz funk greats that everybody should read, uh should go check out. But like let's let's take uh, DJ Andy, for example, a uh, friend friend of yeah. your podcast, friend of our yeah. website. Um you know, she went out and and made you know a book about post punk and, and goth, and now is just sort of but through her own doing. The yep. fact that she put in the work, yeah. now an expert in that field, and you know yeah. should be a person who's gone to and spoken to and interviewed about those things, and not because she you know had the right connections at the right time or whatever, but right. because she put in the work. That's right. amazing. I love that. Yeah. And and even when you then have like, you know, some sort of disagreement or, or, or difference of opinion or whatever, uh, as I know, you know, yourself have, have had off and on recently with uh, Lisa. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce Is it uh, Landa Landa Sewer? I think, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but it was really interesting to see that sort of play out as people are like, Oh, these are two people with a great deal of credibility on the issue who have both put in the work and everything. And it is sort of like, you know, 
know, when you're at an academic conference or whatever, and you're watching yeah. people sort of spar over a particular issue, and it's like, oh, yeah, these these are both, you know, informed people who know what they're talking about, and aren't, you know, it's not just, you know, oh, people like getting into a flame war in YouTube yeah. comments or something like that. There's actually some substance to the debate or to the discussion. And I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's an important part to, I think, having real um, informed discussion, and that's the fact that it can't be just one voice. And that's a thing that has worried me for such a long time about um, like there's there's lots of other blogs out there. Um, but they're one of the reasons that we latch on so much to people who are doing quality work um, out there uh, is, no, you know, not our, to put what we do on the level with like the quietest or whatever. Hmm. But um, there can't just be one voice because one voice yeah. makes it just like there's no opposition to it. There's no debate. It just becomes this 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 unilateral position. Yeah, you're the taste yeah, maker and yeah. everything yeah. suffers. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, so there has to be disagreement, or there at least has to be gradients of opinion within yeah. that, right? Like, I like the fact that, you know, if I look but over the reviews of the new X Marks the Ped Walk, we're on the lower side, and there's some other people on the higher side, but at the very least, if somebody Googles secrets by X Marks the Ped Walk, it's not just going to be our review. Yeah. But I think, I think that that maybe comes with the backswing of that is, and this is maybe something that you were just talking about there with, you know, having to explain to your friend that, no, I'm going to, I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat things just because it's you or whatever, right. is that when it is a smaller world, when it is a smaller, you know, you know, when it's, you're, you're a big fish in a small pond or anything like that, there's sort of, I, I think, and I'm, I'm not going to name any names or anything like that, but I know for a fact that there are some bands and some artists out there who just sort of expect uh, a degree of like, you know, kind of a softball questioning or just a, mm. oh yeah, the new album's great and blah, 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 blah. And here's a bunch of, you know, superlative adjectives to describe it and everything without any sort of, you know, critical reflection on that, right? When you have yeah. this, um, you know, mantra of just like, oh, well, support the scene, support the scene, you know, get out there and support local artists or support, you know, this and this and that. If you are saying anything critical about it, then all of a sudden, you know, oh, well, you're just, you're just jealous of them. You're a hater. Oh, what? Well, you're, you're a critic. What the fuck have you ever done? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's my personal favorite. Unless you yourself have ever done that thing, you aren't allowed to have an opinion about right. that. <laughs> and it's, and that's the double bind of on the one hand, like, oh, I love the press when I get good reviews of my new album, yeah. but oh, obviously, you know, when I got a bad review, those people are just assholes. It's like, well, you can't treat anything we say with an ounce of credibility when it's something good about it and then decide that we don't know what the fuck we're talking about when we say anything negative you can't really have it both ways and that's yeah. like that's a degree of uh i don't know if it's artistic thick skinnedness or just you know being mm. able to i mean it, obviously yeah. every, anybody who puts a record out there is is risking a huge chunk of themselves yeah. and everything yeah. but like that's something that quote you know larger artists or more mainstream artists that's not even a question for them right they're aware that when they're putting something out there pitchfork could just be like oh yeah 3.7 uh, you know and and they know that right and they're ready for that and they're aware of that and if you want to ever kind of if you have an interest in sort of maybe getting out of the oh i i, I don't want to be pinned down or stuck in the the goth industrial ghetto or anything like that i i, I want to i'm bigger than that or something you kind of have to be ready for that degree of kind of critical pushback and again not to name anybody but there's definitely been artists where it's like oh you're getting a bit salty over this yeah and that's why that's why I talk about goth as a dialectical culture. And going back to Lisa, I really, even though I don't agree with her, I absolutely respect the way that she handled the whole thing because yeah. she didn't she didn't lash out and she didn't hide, uh, but she actually with both videos engaged in uh, the conversation both on Facebook and on YouTube reviews and things like that. And you know she came around on certain things where she apologized or revised her opinion, and then some things she explained further and then had a conversation you know with her revised. Uh, uh, or more explained views on that kind of thing. And that's what I think we need um, where so, as some people don't want that and, and we'll just start a, a shouting match. But um, so yeah, that's, that's something I look for, but all right. So uh, moving on, since we're getting a bit over time here, I wanted to, I just watched this uh, vice video the other day mm -hmm. or rewatched it actually, which was a, it was like a five minute video about this current state of the goth scene. And I think oh. it was a great example of a, more of a outsider perspective on something and trying to 
trying to describe it in a relevant way, and I think they got a lot of stuff wrong. Was this uh, wait? Was this the animated one where it's like no, a, that was a no, no, that was the Pitchfork one. I yeah, don't know if I've was, seen the Vice one then. Uh, we could talk about that though, but yeah, I, I can send it to you. But I had I pulled a couple quotes here from essentially the the host of the of the episode was someone who said he was a goth in high school and then uh, grew out of it, and then he was interviewing a Victoria Fashion who is a YouTuber, and so I had a couple quotes I thought was interesting to maybe get your thoughts on. So the first one is he says, uh, it's been interesting to watch the de evolution of goth over the years from truly subversive and full of people making challenging art to a safe space for weird kids to practice makeup and freak out the kids at their school. I mean, uh, it's always kind of been that. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's always been art school kids or like, you know, kids who get picked on at recess, you know, playing dress up and building an identity for themselves. And, and everything like i mean if we go god if you go all the way back to the earliest you know ideas of being like of net goth culture in the mid 90s and everything it was all about that it was all about uh being able being able to be able to sort of sort of sort of carve out an identity for your world that you had carved out for yourself um and again the idea that you're somehow hiding or sheltering yourself i don't even know that i buy that either right mm. because i mean so many people myself included kind of you know grew up in sort of you know like oh suburban or rural towns where you got shit thrown at you you got beat up you got called a faggot all of the time and you went through those you know whatever you want to call it lumps hazing abuse whatever it is for you know dressing that way or listening to that music or whatever it was and i'm not saying that that's good or necessary or anything like that but that's an experience that i think a hell of a lot of people you know have always had yeah i yeah sorry did you want to say something i oh, go I, yeah ahead. i think go my thing is it sounds like and there's kind of a second part to that too but it, it, implicit in his statement i think is it, he's kind of saying that goth used to be subversive and full of challenging art and now it's just a thing that kids do and i think maybe uh because this is a contention i've heard a lot recently is that if you're looking at goth youtubers or that kind of thing from the outside what you take away from it is that um goth is just about makeup tutorials or um or or fashion and if and you can basically transpose that onto the like heteronormative materialistic hegemic culture and mm -hmm. it just has a different mm -hmm. aesthetic so it really doesn't have that subversion that 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 uh, meaning that it used to have like in the 80s and mm -hmm. people could get the wrong idea I, I yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that you could probably make a very good argument that um, there was a point where before, and I, I want to tread very carefully mm -hmm. when I say this, but um, before you would get, I think, a lot more uh, solidarity between people who were outcasts and freaks yeah. at a certain point. Um, uh, and those things have progressively, like the kind of things that we think of as being like weird outsider stuff has become accepted yeah. to a point yeah. where people don't need that kind of support system mm -hmm. anymore. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are still getting shit for who they are and who they are is like, it's because they're gay right. or because they are a minority or a certain ethnicity or a certain religion or whatever else. And so there is always the part of me when people sort of try to make the argument of that still being a thing with goth where I kind of roll my eyes at it and I'm like, well, yes, you get shit, but it's not, you know, <laughs> it's a very different thing than yeah. being discriminated against because of your sexuality or your, your religion or your ethnicity or, or whatever else. By the same token, uh, you know, I, I, I also think it's important to recognize that uh, the subculture has always had an aspect of just being a reflection of the broader mm -hmm. culture. There's always been people for whom it was about the aesthetic and not mm -hmm. anything deeper than that. And that isn't necessarily a bad right. thing to me. Yeah. No, no, it's the I mean, on the one hand, I, I can understand the whole like, oh, it's just this consumerist culture that, you know, reinforces, you know, as you say, like, you know, heteronormative beauty norms and, and things like that. But I think that that goes there all the way back. Uh, at least as far as my understanding of these things goes, that, you know, within a, I mean, all you have to do is look at the very, very short turnaround uh, of, you know, punk culture into being the, the commodification of that and how, you know, if you want to say that, oh, you only have like a, a year or two of true punk music or true punk culture before it all gets sold out and exploded or whatever, well, fine, but then what are you saying, right? right? Like, if, if you want to say that, oh, yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, 
fine, you know, from Gloria Mundi to the end of the Batcave or something like that. That's goth culture, and that was that was real and, and everything like that. And everything since then uh, has just been a photocopy or, or, or plain dress up and, you know, buying expensive clothes from uh, Shrine, Alchemy, Gothic, yeah, Hot Topic, Star, whoever you yeah. want to, you know, throw throw under the under, 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 under the bus for that. I mean, okay, but at the same time, there have always been people doing, I think, really weird, strange, progressive, out there stuff on their own. Like, those things run concurrently with each other. They don't necessarily um, take supplant turns or supply. Yes, yeah, supplant one another. Exactly, right? Like, oh, you know, like, I don't know, fuck bands like, you know, Cinema Strange yeah. or, you know, Phantom Limbs or whatever, who are very much kind of doing their own really weird, strange, out there stuff, very much on their own and very much outside of any form of uh, commodification and everything. Like, that's that's always been yeah, there too and yeah, that's still yeah. that's still there yeah. you know yeah i was just reading uh uh rereading uh mick mercer's uh gothic rock book from i think 92 and somebody in there was saying the mm-hmm. same thing about how uh after 85 uh goth started to get commodified and now all you have are the worst aspects enduring the longest and um all the uh all the good stuff uh ended up being sold in shops so it doesn't mean anything anymore and it, uh, i i don't really get on board with that uh, train and no. thought but so to, just to close out his quote because i thought the last part was kind of funny is he's, he says uh, uh goth just ended up being nerds who like to shop and wear top hats <laughs> <laughs> i mean there, there's an aspect of that sure but i mean that's, that's and i'm not a fan of top hats yeah. i gotta say <laughs> yeah i mean it's a, the nerd thing whatever i mean it's it's, it's we're all fucking nerds yes, about everything. Exactly. And if now, you want, and, and hang on, hang on, hang on. If and if this guy's like giving people shit for like, oh, you're just like reinforcing like you know traditional like heteronormative beauty norms and everything like that, and then you want to throw out the word nerd like it yeah. means anything in 2017 yeah. when nerd culture is like Mainstream the culture, dominant culture, yeah, like fucking culture. Game of Thrones and Avengers movies and video games mm-hmm. and everything like that. Like, what does that word even mean yeah. in this yeah. year? God. All right. Well, a uh, couple, couple, just kind of fun last questions here. I wanted to sure. I, this one's kind of selfish to be honest, but have you guys ever considered doing uh, either for maybe like a, a, a Patreon special thing? I know you guys focus more on, on still within uh, the genres for that, but either like a separate podcast or a bonus thing where you do the off topic stuff that you do at the end of the year. Because uh, personally, I like hearing you guys talk about nerdy stuff and religion and, and other academic topics and wrestling and sports and all that stuff. Is that something you've thought about doing or do you think nobody cares? <laughs> I, I'll tell you my, my, my initial reaction is I would absolutely love to do it, but I don't know that, um, I was funny. I was listening to one of our other favorite mutual podcasts uh, the other day, um, which was uh, the the Flop House, which is a bad movies okay. podcast. Oh yeah, I've heard of that one. People made the point of uh, it was Stuart Wellington from that podcast made the point of you get to a point where um, when you get good at doing something, you always assume people want more of that mm. thing, and there is the part of me that wonders how much diminishing returns, yeah. like how much overexposure is possible. And you know, sometimes we we've already seen it where I think we have you know, five podcasts come out in a month and our download numbers go down. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's too much to expect from that people want more than what we already give them. And I'm very wary to go over that yeah. as well. One thing that I will say that I still am like really feeling an itch for is like doing like, uh, I, I used to run in a little adjunct Tumblr that was just me doing beer reviews and pairing them up with albums. Oh, like, man. you know, here is a great goth or oh, industrial dude, album awesome. to listen to while you have this beer. And if the beer is shit, then it's going to be <laughs> yes. a pretty shitty album <laughs> that I'm, that I'm recommending and everything. And that's oh, amazing. like part of me, like I've got a little bit more time than I used to. Like I get I get really into beer and whiskey writing and I'm kind of like feeling the urge to somehow yeah. like I I wouldn't want to pollute the uh the, the traditional or, or our established uh modes of delivery or anything like that. But I don't know, maybe maybe starting up something like that again uh on the side uh would be kind of fun cuz I I I really like to go down the rabbit hole yeah. with whiskey writing. And I, you know, I cuz that's something I've been trying to figure out recently with the podcast is at what point cuz I feel like uh, we've been kind of rehashing a few things too much. And like, I'm like, well, at what point do we start beating a dead horse? Where can I get yep. more inspiration from and, and kind of diversify it? You know, I used to, when we started, when I first started the show at the beginning, we, I would do a segment about, uh, about beer. And because I was like, oh, it'll add some variety and I'm into beer right now. And, 
And I would get emails from people like, we don't really care about what kind of beer you're drinking. Yep. Can you stop doing that? <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, so I don't know. I've kind of moved some of that online now. I want to start doing some YouTube videos about things, but I'm, I'm kind of in the same place where I'm trying to figure out. Um, I, I just ordered a bunch of new books, so hopefully I, I can get some more inspiration for uh, issues. But I don't I don't want to do too much of the same thing and and nobody cares anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. It is super weird though when you get like those comments or messages or emails where people feel like they're entitled yeah. <laughs> to tell you what to do. Like it's one thing if somebody says I'm a big listener and it really bothers me when you do this, or, right? Yeah. Um, I think that it's not as interesting, or you sound bitter or angry when you talk right. about that topic, or you know whatever else. But occasionally somebody will say something like, "Keep your vegan restaurant reviews or, like opinions yeah. to yourself," and I'm just like, I, I, "Dude, <laughs> I, 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 I'm entitled to talk about whatever yeah. I feel like. Like I'm going to try and keep it relevant to the to the bill of goods you've been sold as a listener of yeah. this podcast. Like I'm certainly not saying that you know if Bruce and I feel like it, we can just talk about pro wrestling every week from here till eternity, and you're still in, you know have to listen to us because we're the, the you know the the goth industrial podcast. But it is kind of weird when people feel entitled to tell you what you can or can't. Yeah, do. yeah, it's like sorry, we're like, we're vegan and we both run pretty hard right, to the left. Right. Those things are going to just come up yeah. from time to time. Yeah. All right. So last, uh, last little bit here because it's uh, kind of related. So I figured I could work it in, but uh, what are your guys thoughts on the undertaker losing his last match and retiring? Okay. I mean, he had to lose that match. He was, you know, taker is such a traditionalist in terms of, of the, uh, the rules and, um, uh, I don't want to call it a belief system, but the, but the, the tradition, the culture. the culture and traditions of pro wrestling that he was absolutely going to go out with his boots on, on his shield. Yeah. He absolutely would have it no other way than losing his last match. I, cause you make the guy who beats you, you make somebody by doing that. Right? I think the impact was lessened by the fact that he had already lost previously to Lesnar, uh, three years previously at mm -hmm. mania. On the one hand, I want to say that you could have had a better choice than Roman Reigns if the project uh, is to kind of create this everlasting moment uh, in the, you know, with, with Taker's legacy. But obviously, Roman Reigns is still going to be the focus uh, of, of, right. of the company for the foreseeable future. The only problem that I have is the idea that Roman is going to try to talk both sides out of his mouth with like, yeah, I'm the guy who like ended the Undertaker's career, which is obviously great face heat uh, for him to get. But then also we're also supposed to sort of respect him in a weird way. And the, the company is very much trying to talk uh, out of both sides of its mouth. That said, The Undertaker was almost single-handedly the thing that got me into pro yeah. wrestling and indirectly probably also helped to get me into goth culture. I'm not going to fucking lie. Um, and, and so... To realize as I was watching that, oh yeah, shit, this thing that has been a part of my life since I was 10 or 11 years old, that's it now. Yeah, brought a tear yeah. to my eye, absolutely. Yeah, I um, I was never a big fan of Taker when I was growing up, so I'm a little less sentimental um, while still recognizing the fact that he has a great body of work. But I mean, it was really sad to watch him in that match. He's broken down and yeah. he couldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Like literally, it was like watching one guy in the ring with a guy who could barely move and who like all the stuff that you associate with Undertaker, he couldn't do. He couldn't do half yeah. of his moves and he looked like he was really winded and having a hard time and there was a bunch of errors that happened in that match, What you know, what what's referred to as botches that are solely because his body is so broken down that he can't do them anymore. So it was a good time for him to retire it's sad that it had to have him go out that way and that the actual match itself is terrible but there was a very nice post-match moment that was you know very pleasant for the fans it was nice it was symbolic it was a nice gesture and you know i, I don't think ultimately people are going to remember this so much as they'll remember the the legacy leading up to yeah, it. and definitely. that's nice yeah. i mean professional wrestling is all kind of about world building and legend building and i you know I think that ultimately, once the bad taste from the incredibly bad match has worn off, like a genuinely terrible wrestling match, once that's gone, people will mostly remember the moment after that and everything leading up to it. Yeah, and, and that's the, kind of the way it's going And, and it's the, closest, the closest thing to him ever breaking character in terms of actually going and embracing his wife, mm -hmm. right? He has never once done interviews out of character or ever acknowledged. Except when any, he was a biker for all those years. Well, yeah, 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 but but he wasn't, but he was never like he was never Mark Calloway. Like there was never any, like he never conducted any interviews as Mark Calloway, right? Yeah, true, like so, true. so the acknowledgement of sort of his external private life there was nice, and it'll be really interesting to see how they uh, handle his Hall of Fame ceremony. Like how in character will he be, or will he sort of like you know I've right, taken the hat right. off, I've taken the cloak off, and now I am just this retired man, and I'd like to kind of talk about that character that I played for all of those years. You know, it's kind of weird. Um, I don't know how closely you pay attention to fan convention stuff, but it seems like. There's two tiers to Elvira. 
Mm-hmm. Like you can either get Cassandra Peterson yeah. or you can get Elvira yeah. at your event. Really? So if you get Cassandra Peterson, she's not in the Elvira yeah. outfit, and you get to meet Cassandra Peterson, who played the character of Elvira, and nobody's excited about that. <laughs> like people still pay for it because that's the closest they're gonna get. But like when you do actually get the Elvira, the the the, the that level is so much more. So I think that it's almost contingent on like Nobody cares that much about Mark Calloway. They care about The Undertaker. And so I would hope that they would tap into that idea of, you know, we're going to go out and it's always going to be The Undertaker. Forever it will always be The Undertaker. Yeah, I I, I started thinking about that when you were talking about it. And really, because Undertaker was, or well, at least my first exposure was in middle school. And that was really my first exposure to as you know kitsch or or cliche as you want to call it the kind of goth uh clothing yeah yeah and i didn't know what it was at the time but i was like man i really fucking love that (laughs) so it was that was kind of a big uh big moment for me and i never actually never really considered that before but no, yeah, I mean, like, when I was off, you know, kind of in, in the suburbs, just making up goth as I went, because, again, pre-internet, and you're just kind of on your own and everything, I would totally rock, like, you know, Undertaker yeah. t-shirts and everything, along with my, like, leather trench coat, terribly applied <laughs> makeup, and all of that business and everything, so, yeah, this is all, all part of that whole, you know, suburban, I mean, not Midwest, right. but, you know, just that whole sort of sh- right. schmoz that you get out there. Uh, all right, don't close your browser, but, uh, guys, thank you so much for coming on. It, it was I've achieved my life goal, and uh, it was really, <laughs> really great to hang out and talk with you guys this was a total blast daniel yeah. thanks so much and you have to come on we have a tech okay yeah deal. i can do that i can do that lovely right on. all right cool guys thanks all right we're gonna go ahead and end it there because we've run a bit over time so no sinister suggestions this month uh we still got some bloopers coming or extra random content at the end coming after the end of the show uh but I would like to let you know that next month we are going to be having on William from uh, the New Goth City website, which is a site where you can find uh, goth and industrial events going on in your neck of the woods. And, uh, we're, you know, we're going to have the, the album review and the news article, but we're going to be talking about Xenogoth, which is his new invention. Uh, it's not been released yet. If you go to xenogoth.com, you'll know a bit more about it uh, once it actually goes live. But it's supposed to be, or he's billing it at least, as the next evolution of goth. So we're going to be talking about where goth should go in the future, what it means for a culture to evolve, uh, how much we should be looking at the past, and all that kind of stuff. Thank you for listening If you enjoyed the show and you'd like to support us, get some extra content, you can go to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. Take a look at what kind of rewards you can get. And if you've got a dollar, if you can afford a dollar a month, uh, please go ahead and sign up and help us out. Thank you again for listening. It means the world to us. So until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information. Yeah, and it actually would have been um, 16, but luckily I remembered that I had this to do, so... (laughs) <laughs> oh my god that's insane i don't know yeah. how you could possibly do that we were um, just yeah i get to pick the music at work and i get to okay. work with people and i get tips so those are like my three things <laughs> man you are a rock star i was just talking with my friends because we were watching doctor who about uh how my son just just oh and here he comes hi what are you doing <laughs> He doesn't do a very good job of being put to bed, does he? Do you want to say hi? No, they never do. Nope. Hi. Hi. Hi, How Link. What are you doing, Link? What are you doing? I can't see anybody. Yeah, you don't have the headphones on. <laughs> do you want to say what your favorite superhero is? I'm a six gun. Okay. Well, stay out of my room then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can take. You did make that for me, but I have to do a, my work now. Okay. So, if you need something, just ask mommy. Okay. All right. Close my door. Thank you. <laughs> Cutie. Love you. 
All right. So, uh, lost my. Did anybody else watch the uh, Doctor Who premiere? Uh, I was... No, I again just with work and everything. I, I took right. some chill time afterwards, so I unfortunately yeah. missed it. <clears throat> yeah, I did too. I mean, I, um, Chris and Yesenia had the premiere thing, but he yeah. canceled that like at the last minute, so oh. that didn't end up happening, okay. which is probably for the best because I think it would have been very hard for me to get all the way from their place back here. In, in time. a timely manner, because yeah. I think well, they're probably a good half hour, 45 minutes from me. Let's see here. You want me to turn the light on? Yeah. All right, give me one second. And then you... So now as far as the, the yeah. club night you do, um, what kind of roles do you play in that usually? I mean, it sounds like you DJ a little bit, if not all the time. But what else do you do with it? Yeah, so um, originally when it started, it was me and my husband. My husband did the technical aspect. I handled the booking, social media, marketing, managing, um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, just the general keeping the community together, you know, social interaction, all that. Um, my husband recently stepped out and um, from the club, and um, now I'm starting to do more of the technical side. So... Uh, you know, we come in, I help set up the sound system, I'm learning how to run sound and lighting. So pretty much, you know, I, um, a little bit of everything, I'd say. Um, I, I have a really great team uh, with me right now, Dead City, who um, is a team of volunteers, comes in every week, you know, and they just do it because they love it. And it's it mostly younger, um, you know, people. And, you know, they come in. Are they in. all uh, like former patrons or are they yeah. just other people you know from outside? Well, n yeah, no, they're, they're people that came to the club and, you know, it got to the point with time commitments and time and energy for, you know, myself and for Gopal where, um, you know, we were like, you know, we, I think we're going to have to shut goth that night down, you know, and not for lack of attendance, not for lack of want, but because we were just so exhausted and, mm -hmm. you know, it was just really hard on us. And, you know, these individuals, you know, well, actually, Jack, who uh, is the manager upstairs at the uh, restaurant, he, he said, you know, I, that's the person we were originally working with. And he's like, you know, I love this. I don't want to see this go. And really, no one did. And so he got a team together under his management company and said, OK, like we're keeping this going. And because of the love of our attendees, that has what has kept Goth Night going. That's where our, you know, our elbow grease and our grunt work and all of that comes in are these people coming in, you know, grabbing the flyers that I, you know, design and drop off mm -hmm. and they go hit the streets so I don't have to. You yeah, know, they're the awesome. ones that come in and set up. And yeah, it's it's really, I mean, it's a really kind of, I feel a special little space that we have. And, you know, we uh, pretty much every band that comes through, whether it's local or touring, says, you know, this is, you know, one of the, or if not the best show we've ever played. Your crowd is amazing. You know, it, it's encores and it's, you know, actually cheering. It's, it, you know, you're not playing to an empty room. You know, the, mm -hmm. the head count is always variable. You never know who you're going to get in. But whoever is there is there because they're excited to see you. And it comes out in the crowd. And it's it's really amazing to watch, you know, sitting back at the table and seeing it. But, um, yeah, so I do a lot of that. I, I DJ regularly. Um, <clears throat> we also have a couple of um, house DJs um, as well that, that, that DJ too. And, yeah, it's one of those things where it's uh, – I'm kind of a jack of all trades, I think. All right, <laughs> awesome. I am chugging uh, down a really big ass, uh, whatever, um, red eye hammerhead shot in the dark, whatever you want to call it. The uh, you know the drip drip with espresso added in. Oh yeah. Make yeah, sure I'm extra dark. peppy for this. So. There's a name for that. <laughs> There's like umpteen different names for that, depending on which town you're in. Like I've gone yeah. in, like I some I was first introduced to it, and somebody was like, "Oh, it's a hammerhead." So then I tried to order a hammerhead somebody at, somewhere else, <laughs> and they were like, "I have no idea what you're talking about." Yeah. I explained it. They're like, "Oh yeah, red eye." I'm like. Shh, Sure, fine, great, whatever. Have you ever had the thing where you ask for a snake bite at a bar and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about? It's yeah. Like super I've, weird. I've stopped asking because every time I do it, they, they're they confused and then I have to explain it. And so I just stopped asking. It's more of an English thing, I think. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's weird because like, 
apart from like you know old fossil goths it really is only right. associated with like you know young chav like berberry kids and everything like that but oh no i had the um the one of the old bars that i used to dj at i explained it to the to the bartender he actually got really into it and so month you know whenever i'd be djing there or whatever he'd always just have one of those ready with the two like little venom drops of cassis in it i'm like fuck yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> getting yeah. me my goth crate on the side here <laughs> <laughs> well the other thing is every time uh whenever i order absinthe at a goth event they always do the thing where they set the sugar cube on fire right and i'm like you're burning all the alcohol and it also makes it taste worse <laughs> like, yeah why? yeah it's a, i it finally like had it done properly uh in germany for like the first time i'm like oh this is actually quite lovely mild sweet i'd been drinking it straight like out of the bottle uh in the czech republic oh my God. previous. so uh, well wow. wasn't there that wild uh it was a a birthday party for a friend of ours here in Vancouver where we ended up drinking a bunch of it in a hot tub oh, Jesus, which is like the most wrong. terrible experience of my life <laughs> that was no that was one. my birthday that was my that was 30, your birthday that was my that's 30th right. birthday and we ended up in a friend's hot tub you know with a bunch of bottles of absinthe just drinking it raw yeah that was that was uh, a bad idea <laughs> yeah i've never tried it i've never done shots or just you know that's it sounds awful yeah no it genuinely is it was just so cheap in the czech republic i'm like this is going to be the easiest way to get drunk while i'm over here doing my uh, yeah that's doing my true. field school so Weirdly enough, uh, I go to uh, uh, Europe uh, once a year to, to visit my folks usually. I'm, I'm actually leaving in a week, which is why I'm recording this weekend. Thank you very much for accommodating that, by the way, Daniel. That's awesome. Yeah, no problem. I My family does what I tell them, so I was like, wife, <laughs> get out of the house. She's like, okay. <laughs> Take Link with you. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I have questions about uh, how he's feeling about uh, the, the new Zelda in a minute. But uh, it is getting super hard in Italy, especially, to find absinthe. Like, when I oh, first really? went there years ago, it was super easy to find stores that had a giant selection of it. Like, mm-hmm. they would have a bunch of, like, the shitty brands. They're, like, you know, neon green sourpuss-looking yes. stuff that has, like, a picture of a fairy on the bottle. Like, that yeah. stuff you can still find everywhere. But you also used to be able to find reputable brands of it in various places where, you know, it actually had the wormwood, et cetera, et cetera. And now mm-hmm. that stuff, I don't know if they've cracked down on import laws or it's become too expensive for people to uh-huh. stock or whatever else. But the last couple times I've gone looking to buy a bottle for – I always bring one back for, for Dawn. Yeah. Uh, as a thank you for watching my place while I'm out of town. And yeah. I haven't been able to find good stuff. Hmm. But, so – Last year, I brought her back grappa instead, which uh, <laughs> is a similarly, uh, you know, kick in the balls type drinking experience, but not as fun. I should check in with um, this couple that I made friends with at that festival in Germany, out in the middle of the the, the forest where we were out. It was the <laughs> gothest fucking thing ever. We're out in the middle of a forest in Germany. It's nocturnal culture night. I'm mostly there to see Curly and Camera. We yeah. make friends with some of the people who are like running the sound and everything there. Turns out the, the wife runs the absinthe bar that's happening there. So I'm sitting there in the middle of a forest in Germany. She's like serving me different varieties of absinthe as I'm sitting at the bar watching um, Ordo Rosario's Equilibrio, you know, play uh, play like you know these super like neo folk songs about BDSM and shit. Like this is this is the best. This is <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the kind of thing I I just sit in my room and ejaculate to while I dream about it. Yeah, I know, that's, I know. This is just like. This, this is Pete Gotham right here. It's, I may as well just pack it in and move to the suburbs after this. But yeah. anyway, we, we should we should. This is all good stuff we could actually be using, okay. so we can we can we can get started if you want. 